All right. I think that we can call this meeting to order. So it is 501. I'd like to call to order the Contra Carlisle Regional School Committee. And tonight we have Cynthia Rainey joining us as chair. Temporarily. The chair for the day yes. for, the Concord, for the Concord side. You want and I'll to call the Concord School Committee to order. And it is 501. Yeah. Yep. We can do a roll call. Okay. Uh, Alexa, did you go? I didn't. I did. Uh, forgive me. I'm sorry. A booth here. Present. Uh, here. Where's that here? Rainy here. Wilson here for region. Um, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. Does somebody want to make a motion? Sure. I will move that the Concord School Committee and Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee enter into executive session under purpose two of the open meeting law to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel and return to open session at 5.30 p.m. For both? For both. Second for both. Thank you. Roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Loud, I for both. Mestad, I for both. Rainy, I for both. Wilson for region. Hey. All right. Here. So See do we all back here at 5.30? Well, anyone who's not going to be. Well, seeing the group in the room is making me very happy already. <laughs> For good reason. Yes, I agree. Good reasons. <laughs> Not only have these folks recreated their entire curriculum due to a pandemic, but they're also hard at work on what we're talking about tonight. Hi, Kristen. So I think we're at the hour. Yeah, do we have Heather back? Oh, there you are. Oh, you're on mute. Okay. Okay. So, um, like to take a motion to first welcome. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. We're so looking forward to this presentation. Um, and um, I want to make a note that we are being recorded. And I'll take a motion to return the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee to open session at 531. And I'll make a motion to call the Concord School Committee to order at 5.31. Roll call. Oh, a second. Yeah, I don't think you need a motion to bring us back into okay. order. I okay. think so. Do you need we're anything? Back. No. So we're back. And we're right. back. Yes. We're back. <laughs> Great. We'll roll call again, however. We can roll call again, though. Anderson present. Booth present. Out present. Maystack present. Rainey present. Wilson present for region. So we will start uh, with public comment. If you are new to the meeting and would like to make a comment, you can click the participant button and you can raise your hand. We'll look to see if we have any raised hands. I don't think so. I don't think so. No. We can move on to the reading of the minutes. There are a motion to accept the open session joint meeting from November 10th, 2020. So moved for both. Second for both. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. I for both. Ms. Dent, I for both. Rainey, I for both. Wilson for region. Thank you. Shares and liaisons reports. So Sarah, just so I don't forget, can we start off with uh, Dr. Hunter just wants to make a brief report? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. I just um, thought since I don't have a standing spot on the agenda to talk COVID with you, it seemed important that we make sure we find a few minutes. Um, we've obviously had considerable increase in cases the last week or 10 days. 
Um, this afternoon, we recorded our 27th case since school opened. Um, 12 of those in the last eight days. So clearly we're in the thick of the rise in cases that's happening statewide. We are not in any way experiencing anything unusual to other districts that are hosting in-person school. Um, in fact, I'm encouraged in several fronts that what we are seeing first and foremost is not school spread at all, no transmission within the schools between um, students or staff. Um, and second of all, I think there's a lot of processes that are working. Uh, we're seeing quarantine processes be very effective. That's minimizing contact tracing where kids have already been out of school because they're a close contact to another situation, often in their own home. And um, because they're already out when they get ill or test positive or both, um, they, they don't have impact on the schools. Um, so I think that's that's also been very, very encouraging. Um, we're watching it very carefully, obviously. Um, should we see school, school transmission? I think that's, to me, the place we really look at um, whether we need some time away from each other or not. Um, I think until then, our cases are pretty wide, widely spread among the schools. There's not one hotspot. There's not one place this is coming from. Um, I do want to voice some support to those who've gotten sick that uh, in some cases they can trace back to where they were. But recently, there are some people doing everything right and community spread has started. And that is when people's story becomes, I don't know where I got it. I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and I'm, I still ended up getting it. So another reason for us to watch carefully what's happening. Um, I think overall, the goal I've had is that we're managing as much of it as we can at the leadership level. So the staff and teachers are keeping teaching and learning going. Um, and I think in in whole, in, overall, that's, that's the case, having been in a school yesterday. Um, and the hope is that even when more dramatic things happen, uh, for example, quarantining an elementary classroom, which I think is the top of my list of dramatic at the moment, um, we've made that pretty fluid and uh, effective as well. So kudos to everyone involved on in all these things I'm talking about because I'm a, a piece of all of it. Um, special thanks to our, our public health nurse, Trish McGeehan, is by my side literally 24-7, seven, seven days a week. Um, she is, the plan we're having is that she tries to do contact tracing and keep the school connected cases with her rather than send them out to the state tracers. If, if our families are being managed through the state tracers, we lose all personal contact with how that's playing out. And we also don't support the family in the same way. So early on, we decided that was the goal. And Trish has held to that. Um, in many cases, that means she's supporting adults who are ill and then trying to help navigate the impact on the kids, which may or may not turn into impact on us. Um, and I think we're just really, really lucky to have someone so committed. Her only reason for doing that is because she wants to see us stay open. <laughs> so um, we're on a common mission here, a challenging one. We're in the thick of what we knew was going to, this is the predicted spike, right? This is the difference is we're still in person learning. Um, so I did post uh, webinars, the staff on Thursday, I'm going to offer them some time to talk with us. And on Friday, parents, Trish will join me. And we'll bring some other data. Um, we can break data. We're keeping incredibly tight records, so we can share just um, categories of where exposures are coming from and you know the count by building if people are interested and um, just get a bigger look at it and hear what those questions and concerns are, because we understand that that is, you know, the anxiety is growing a bit. and want to be sure we're um, thoughtfully providing as much information as possible. So I just wanted to, to name where we are and what's been happening. Um, I, I guess I'm going to say one more thing, which is I expect there will be more positive cases. We have a significant, and by significant, I mean 10 or less um, families 
in quarantine. And as those play out, and I'll name an issue with the testing system right now, you might get sick on a certain day. You might wait days to get a test. You might wait more days to get your test result back, which means you're well into your isolation period before we have a confirmed case. I think that can prove to be very confusing and does confuse people on a number of fronts. That's one of the things we rely heavily on Trish for is helping us to understand and comprehend all those timelines. Um, and right now that the system with the holiday um, clearly has taken, taken on a lot uh, last week and into this week, hopefully it's going to start to settle back in. Um, so I do expect there will be more cases, but that doesn't mean there'll be cases of kids in school necessarily. Um, and it could be playing out some of what we're seeing. And I don't know if you've seen the national and state level data, but 80% of COVID is transmitted within the home, um, not in social settings. And otherwise, I would absolutely say anecdotally, we are, we are seeing exactly that same pattern. Um, so I don't know how much, you, I think tonight we won't spend too much time on, we've got other, a lot of other things on the agenda, but I wanted to name what was happening in our approach and what we're watching for. Um, and one last comment, we're running a pretty tight ship. We've tightened up even more. We are now telling all staff and families that have anyone in the house with symptoms that everybody stays home until they have a negative COVID test. That is um, something we just started this week as we came back from the holiday. And I do think that matters because then there's um, already people, you know, pseudo isolated before they find out that COVID may be in their home. So, um, and the travel order, you've all seen my reminders over and over. Um, and I just have to say, I think we are so well supported by this community and people are really working hard to do the right thing. Nobody wants to be the person that closes school, I assure you. <laughs> um, so we're all working together and I feel that every day and I'm really grateful. You know, December 1st, I don't think any of us really thought we'd still be in school. So kudos to the work that it takes and community effort to make it happen. Well, it's a, it's a credit to every staff member and every educator that uh, uh, is there every, every day working with you. Uh, none of us are happy about this, but uh, your information at least uh, uh, sustains the confidence that we need, that we're doing the right thing. And uh, yeah. we've, we've got to keep bearing down on yeah. that goal of, of doing the right thing and keeping the schools open and keeping people safe. Thank you, Lori. No, thank, thank you. And, and well done to the students who, yeah. are, who are all doing everything that they're supposed to do. I mean, they sure are, Sarah. They they have since we opened and they continue to. We're really proud and um, trying to really reinforce that they're as much a part of the success as anybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to say the fact that there hasn't been any transmission in the schools yet is quite a testament to, I mean, all of the above, students, all of the staff, the whole structure that you put together over the summer. I mean, the, that whole process worked. <laughs> it's, the fact that it's not spreading in the schools is really amazing. Yeah. So thank you. It is quite an achievement. So thank you, Dr. Hunter and all the staff and the students and families. Uh, thank you and congratulations, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's a success story and uh, we owe it to everyone involved. So thank you. Great. Okay. Any, do, do we have other, do, do any um, committee members have updates from their liaison ships or committees. Oh, I'll just do a quick update about FinCom. I'm going to send around the slides. I do encourage um, members to watch. They give a carry the floor, gave a very thorough presentation of the current state of the Concord. Um, uh, not, I wouldn't say budget, but uh, uh, money coming in. And uh, she is a, it's a $5 million swing <laughs> between worst case scenario and best case scenario. So um, I encourage you to watch it and uh, I could send around the presentation, but they did have some discussion after that. I recommend watching it at 1.5 speed. <laughs> it doesn't take as long. Um, yeah, that's, that's my report for FinCom. I don't know. I watched part of the select board. I don't know if any, there wasn't really anything I don't think of import to us, but I could 
missed something. I don't think Alexa or I caught anything on uh, select board that should be passed on tonight, um, but we're trying to attend faithfully. I've got uh, two items, uh, Sarah and Cynthia. Um, one, uh, with, with great sadness, um, announcing the passing of Carol Birdsall, um, who many of us knew and respected greatly. Um, she was a, a much beloved elementary school teacher who uh, did remarkable things with uh, her students, uh, notably her, her uh, introduction of uh, William Shakespeare uh, to uh, young children. She did things that uh, I can't speak for others, but I, I didn't know they were going to be possible when she embarked on some of her, uh, her endeavors with kids, uh, elementary school children and uh, Shakespearean studies and drama. But she did it uh, beautifully, and uh, she'll be she'll be missed. So I feel it necessary to note that. On a very different note, the uh, Concord Middle School Building uh, Committee is uh, getting underway again. Uh, there was a meeting immediately before the Thanksgiving break with the Design Subcommittee uh, that looked at uh, the uh, the data that. Uh, enabled an analysis of the design that was on the table in the winter when we suspended operations uh, and the full committee regathers reconvenes uh, on December 10 at 730 in the morning and that's a publicly posted meeting and the public is, is welcome to attend. I believe the primary emphasis at the beginning will be to kind of reset the clock and uh, rechart how we get from where we are now to town meeting of fall 2021 when the next significant town meeting step might occur. Laurie, does that kind of capture it, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we'll just name the challenges the committee's coming back to, which is uh, a building that in its first draft of size is, is too big because the costs associated with it are, too, are higher than what we would have aimed for. So we have work to do. I'm excited to get back to that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I think Cynthia, we're one, one thing we hadn't mentioned, I'm sorry, Court. No, um, go ahead. One thing we haven't mentioned is our, and, and Jared too, our ongoing meetings with the Concord Capital Facilities Committee. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, yes. Um, we have a public event next, what night is it? The Wednesday, I believe. I believe you're right. Wednesday, 7.30. Wednesday the 9th. Um, really, our focus has been on very big projects um, and how they get vetted and prioritized at the town level. I think that's a fair one-line summary. Um, not in terms of the actual making decisions, but in terms of this committee's charge as the process of how how the town's going to work through those questions when they come up. So, yep. I think just keeping that on your radar, it, it's a public event next week. I want to be sure we mentioned it. Good. Thank you. Sure. If we have no more, uh, no more updates than uh, court. I believe you had a correspondence. Uh, the Concord School Committee received a uh, uh, letter, very brief letter uh, of thanks and acknowledgement to all the uh, educators and the school committee for efforts over the summer that uh, uh, have brought us to this this place, uh, December 1, with schools still open. And so this was a, a very heartfelt thank you note on the part of uh, a family that wanted us to hear that. And then secondly, we got a uh, uh, letter from the uh, uh, bargaining unit uh, that handles the building services workers for the Concord Public Schools, asking that we commence uh, negotiations for the new contract. And we'll see more of these letters from the different bargaining units with which we will engage this year. And we're looking forward to it. That's what I've got. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I think then we can uh, invite uh, Linda and Amy to to present and student update now. Just me today. Linda was not able to make it last minute. Um, we don't really have much of an update here. because oh, can you can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, we don't have much of an update because not much is happening right now. I kind of just asked around to see like what questions people had and mostly they were asking about like what's going to happen with COVID and what's going to happen with winter sports, which I'm guessing is still pending. So we don't really know, but a lot of juniors wanted to know what the plan was for MCAS this year. Mm. <laughs> Well, so first all of all, right questions. yeah, don't, don't we wish we had the answer for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> athletics is on tonight, Amy. So we'll have some direction, I think at the end of the evening, um, in terms of MCAS, and I meant to mention this court had reminded me, I should the, um, national assessment that the, uh, middle school had been randomly selected to participate in, um, did get moved a year. So we're grateful that the state and national organization realized that that was a smarter plan than trying to administer it in this. What we haven't heard is from the state level. Um, there's still talk of going forward. There's talk of different purposes for the test, talk of different administrations. So we, um, there are is an option for some kids to test in January. We decided not to encourage that option right now. And um, we'll, we're gonna have time to see what happens between March and May. Um, there's still a lot of political factors influencing this, including Washington's transition. So I think that's probably the next benchmark is to see what the Biden administration lines up because they actually drive a lot of there's a there's a, a path into the MCAS from that, and then there's a path the state legislators can take. And I don't think the legislators are going to consider anything until they see what the Biden administration's approach will be to assessments. I know it's high on the agendas. It's already hitting all the um, information that's pouring out in terms of lobbying to them. So it's going to be a civics exercise this year, Amy. <laughs> the short answer to that question. Okay, and then my my second question is: This is more from Student Senate, but we were looking at uh, policies you guys passed a couple weeks ago, and one of them was about student involvement in decision making. Yeah. And we kind of want to know like more about what like would would have sent Student Senate play a role in that? Would you want like uh, like me and Linda can make? Oh, we want like me and Linda and a few other people to play a role in that committee, or what that general thinking was. So I, I will offer up a preliminary answer, and that is that uh, because we haven't we haven't uh, really discussed this, Amy. Okay. Um, we look to the Massachusetts Association for School Committee for guidance on policies, and then sometimes uh, have to back up and say, how do we make that functional here at CCHS? Um, so I'd offer up uh, that I. I and I'm only one member of the committee, but I think we should start by looping the two of you in uh, as the Senate representatives on the all communications for that committee as a first step in working out what ultimately that relationship could look like. Mm -hmm. So that you see, you see the communication, you see the traffic, you see what's being prioritized. Um, and uh, you know, you have uh, a, a voice, uh, just as every community member does, uh, uh, but you have a voice with a title, which is uh, the li the formal liaison. So you you have a considerable voice. Okay, thank you. Uh, and and the other thing I would add is new policy subcommittee this year. So give us a month or two to get things smoothed out because okay. the new yes. members are. Uh, uh, getting in place with their, their new job. Thank you. That's no, thank, you thank you for bringing that up. You're paying attention. That's <laughs> yes. beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Anything else? No, that's it for us. I, there isn't much happening right now because so yep. many things are out of season, but that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. And so now we have our uh, our cultural competency and anti-racism and curriculum presentation. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Kristen Herbert and Andrew Michi and all of the faculty who's here to present the wonderful things that are happening on this front. Um, I think we'll listen to the presentations and committee members. We can take notes and, and ask questions at the end um, when we've been able to digest it all. That sounds fair enough to everyone. 
I thought I might just offer one reminder before we throw it over to Kristen and all the teachers that are here. Uh, we did this a little in reverse order. The next agenda item after the presentation is a outline of a strategic planning um, a process that we'll be, you know, touching base on, and it's a draft form, so it'll be a live document. It, but it is the big picture of the cultural competency and anti-racism work. And so what we've been doing is bringing you, in August, we brought you, Kristen and Andrew brought you that big picture, and now we're bringing you individual pieces of it, which in total is the big picture. So you had the kids here a month ago or so, um, and that was one piece of the work. Tonight, you're going to hear curriculum, which is another piece of the work. And when we look at the draft outline of a strategic planning effort, you'll see that there's a whole number of efforts that really equate to our, our activities here. So I think some of the feedback I got after our last meeting was just to be sure to open all of these uh, focus discussions with the big picture view and uh, make sure that everyone understands each of the pieces is, is how the big picture is coming together. So with that, we'll turn it over to Kristen and let her cue And I up. think um, we're gonna, Aaron's gonna make it so Andrew can share his screen. He's gonna be our driver tonight. Um, and before we begin, I wanna introduce someone I think hasn't been introduced to our school committee yet. I'm not sure, Dr. Paula Martin, I know you're here. If you could unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Martin is our cultural competency expert. She's our consultant, um, and she works with um, IDEAS um, and teaches professional development courses on cultural competency. Uh, she's also a professor um, and teaches uh, student teachers uh, about cultural competency and was a former administrator in Needham. But Paula, can you tell us a little bit more about your work? So, uh, because uh, Dr. Martin is entwined in every single aspect of our work <laughs> and has been for, I don't know, four or five years. So we have a great, great partner. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, and it's, it's, it's an honor to be here. As Kristen said, I've been doing this work uh, with ideas for about 30 years, uh, working with educators, working with administrators, uh, even students. Um, and once I retired, I we worked even more. Um, it's a joy to be here in uh, Concord. Um, as the kids say, you have it going on. Uh, <laughs> there is a commitment, uh, there's conversation, uh, there's action, um, and a willingness from the inside out to make a difference. Um, and that's what impresses me the most. It's not just sort of the, uh, you know, the lip service of what to do, but really taking, as Laurie said, you know, taking your wider piece and really doing something with it. Um, so I'm excited to uh, hear the presentations tonight. Some of them were in courses that I, uh, workshops I did in the summer. Um, I laughed, Lori, when you said MCAST uh, about an hour and a half ago. I uh, just finished doing some MCAST work. I sit on the bias review committee for MCAST and for college boards. So, <laughs> you know, we read, we read for bias. Um, and no, they didn't say anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thought you had the inside track there, Paul. <laughs> no, but questions are still being developed. I'll, I'll say that. Um, so I'm excited for this evening. Um, Thanks, Paula. Thank you. So, Andrew, I don't know if you're able to share your screen. All right, and Andrew's going to start us off. First couple of slides. All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening uh, for our presentation on curriculum examples relating to uh, cultural competency and anti racist education. So our strategic objective around this work um, really resides in uh, our strategic objective of inclusive culture, uh, which states here to create a collaborative and inclusive culture in the schools and community 
that values diversity and recognizes the contributions and uniqueness of each learner. Part of our five uh, strategic initiatives um, is, is, as you can see here, um, includes uh, Strategic Initiative 3.3, uh, which is uh, focused on increasing uh, culturally responsive curriculum and students' knowledge and understanding of a wide variety of perspectives and learning styles. So uh, today's presentation is really focused on that um, part of our strategic plan. Great, and if you could just go back for one second, Andrew, yes. just to that slide. I just wanted to point out what Dr. Hunter said at the top of the hour. So we've basically taken the five parts of cultural competency and broken them into different meetings that we'll have it update you on the uh, initiatives. So we did our vision in August um, and um, we did uh, the last part, the um, student groups and community partnerships in November. Uh, this month we're doing the curriculum and then in January, we're talking to you, updating you about hiring a diverse staff and finally in February about our ongoing professional development. So as many of you may or may not know, um, our district has a very active uh, pre-K through 12 cultural competency and uh, anti-racist steering committee that is comprised of close to 30 educators. Our committee has been meeting for a number of years uh, to coordinate and give input on curriculum, professional development, institutional practices, and the hiring of educators of color. As we uh, have endeavored through our steering committee meetings, it was clear, it has been clear, um, that as a school community, uh, we needed a clear stance on what our shared vision and understanding um, was for our collective work of cultural competency, as well as our growing uh, sense of urgency towards an anti-racist mindset. Uh, thus, uh, the steering committee drafted and finalized the following statement you see, uh, you see here back in uh, the 2017 and 2018 school year. Uh, we feel that this statement really grounds our work. Um, these words that you see uh, on the screen, uh, this vision uh, really is woven into our strategic plan and is a reflection of our school's priority, uh, priorities as we continue to be intentional and proactive about serving the needs of all of our students, and in particular, our students of color from uh, Boston, Concord, and Carlisle. Uh, the statement is as follows. We strive to be a more culturally competent uh, community. We support our diversity of race, gender, religion, national origin, gender identity, color, ancestry, sexual orientation, and ability. By our choices and actions, we promote all members to feel recognized, respected, and valued. We have set our intention to be responsive, proactive, and empathetic to all facets of culture and diversity. The goal of continuously developing our cultural competency is that it will enable our students to develop the values, skills, and behaviors needed to effectively interact in a culturally diverse community both locally and globally. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, so when we came uh, in August, Andrew and I, to give you the overview uh, and the vision, uh, we touched on a few examples of curriculum, which you can see listed on the screen. Uh, we really took a hard look at social studies, for example, when we had our um, kindergarten through grade 12 social studies uh, review committee. Uh, we looked at our social emotional curriculum, um, open circle, home base, and advisory. We talked about stocking our classroom libraries um, and our, our school libraries with uh, books by diverse authors and with diverse uh, main characters uh, so that every, we call it uh, windows and uh, mirrors. The mirrors is that every child can see themselves reflected and that every child can have a window into cultures that are different than their own. So what you'll hear tonight is um, 
a deepening of um, some of those pieces of work. You'll hear a lot about grade two social studies, grade eight social studies, and so forth. Um, and then you'll also hear about things that are unrelated to all of this. So how we got our fabulous group of 22 educators that are gonna present tonight is literally one email. I sent out an email to our cultural competency committee asking who would like to share. Um, and not only are all the folks that you're gonna hear from tonight literally reinventing what it means to teach, some of them 25 year veteran classroom expert teachers, um, and we're all kind of back to square one. But as they did this, um, and I love Paula Martin always tells us, you're reinventing curriculum anyway, why not incorporate more cultural competency into it? And that is exactly what most of these people have done. And even though there's 22 people here today, there could be so many more because our staff is completely committed to this work. Um, and it's, we're just really excited. So what you'll hear tonight is uh, mostly pretty new initiatives, I would say within the last three or four years. A few um, that are 20 years in the making. I, I think Sharon Staggers Moss, I'm talking to you. Um, and um, all of these folks are on our cultural competency committee, but uh, it doesn't matter. Everyone's sort of committed to this. Um, so, and you'll see every school represented. So that's exciting. So we're gonna basically march through the grades um, and we're gonna start with um, Colleen talking about children's literature in kindergarten. Hi everyone. Um, so as you know, story time and picture books are a huge part of kindergarten. So one way to make sure we're being as culturally responsive as we can and continually working on that is to very carefully and intentionally choose our books. So um, this first slide is a few author studies I do with my class. Um, you can look at Brian Pinckney. I give them some biographical information. There he is when he was about their age. There he is now. Um, his illustrations are done in scratch art, so the children try out their luck at scratch art. Um, they can relate to this man very easily, even though they've never met him. Um, when we read JoJo's Flying Sidekick, I tell them that he actually has a black belt in Taekwondo, so they think that's very cool. Next to him in his Taekwondo picture is a, a kindergartner's um, rendition of JoJo herself from the book. Below that is Max Found Two Sticks, and believe it or not, Brian Pinkney is not just an accomplished author, illustrator, and Taekwondo master, he's also a, a very competent drummer. Um, so we read that book, and then the next picture is a child with sticks. We use Lumi sticks, and again, this goes across all curriculum areas. There's math with the sticks for the patterns, there's music, there's gross and fine motor skills. Um, with Irene Smalls, we do a movement activity. One of her books, Jonathan is a Mummy, is about a boy and his mom going for a walk and they do all these crazy, silly, fun steps. And I have these feet that normally a child picks one, but um, I pick for them during COVID and they do a running in place or a bunny hop, some movement that was in the book. And the last book on this slide is Sheila Hamanaka. She's a Japanese American author and some of her books include origami that she did with her dad. And she mentions that she never saw children like her in the book she read as a child. So it's a great springboard for discussions. Andrew, if you'd show the next slide. Thank you. Um, and these are two other ways we use children's literature. On the left is examples of social justice books. Of course, we talk about Martin Luther King and they write about their dreams. Um, we talk about Ruby Bridges, which is great because they get to see that a child can actually be a hero and a child can be brave. Um, more recently, I introduced Ron McNair. He's a hero just for being one of the first African-American astronauts, but he was also a hero when he was nine. And in the book, Ron's Big Mission, we learned that when he was nine years old, he frequented a hometown library in South Carolina. And because he was black, he was not allowed to take out books. He could only read in the library or somebody white would have to take them out for him. And at nine years old, he demanded equal rights in the library. He wanted to take books out and he, he got it changed. And lastly, I use children's literature to learn about being an ally. And everybody knows about the snowy day and Peter, the character and the other books that he's in. But what they don't always know when they get to me is Ezra Jack Keats actually invented the character Peter after being inspired by one of the pictures you see below his own picture. 
And this boy was in a series of photographs in Life magazine. And Ezra Jack Keats said, you know, I don't see any children's books that have kids that look like him in them. So I'm going to make up a character and I'm going to write some books about him. And that's how we got Beloved Peter. And that leads us into talking about you can be an ally. So thank you. Thank you, Colleen. You're welcome. Next up, Mr. Bob Farty. Hi. Um, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, probably the inspiration for this curriculum started back in 2014 when Kristen Herbert and I met with um, Mariah Madison from Robbins House. And uh, from that point, uh, realized there was a big chunk of Concord history that's not being taught, particularly the, the narrative of African Americans who lived in Concord, particularly those in the 19th century. So as you can see on the screen, um, the students in this unit uh, learn that by using a variety of primary sources, they uncover and discover information about the past. Knowledge of the past helps us understand the present and individuals and groups can make a difference in their communities and the world. And in this particular unit, which is taught throughout the year, uh, I did not want this to be a one and done experience. I did not want it to be just, it's February, so it's Black History Month. I wanted it to be an integral part of the curriculum in second grade that's like a thread that goes throughout the year. And so we look at the stories of African-Americans who lived here in Concord. Um, and students really at this age really need something present and visible. And so the unit, and I'm not gonna go through every part of it, but the unit begins with looking at street signs. Uh, we have three streets in Concord that were named after uh, people of color. One of them being a woman, Jenny Dugan. The others two uh, were formerly enslaved African-Americans, uh, Brister Freeman and, um, sure, I'll, I'll think of the other one in a minute, um, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Hutchinson and oh, for Peter Spring Road. And so, um, they look at a street sign, which I have a picture of it on a Google slide presentation of Jenny Dugan Road. And on the sign, it says that Jenny Dugan was from Acton. Um, she was married in 1805 to a man named Thomas Dugan, who was a runaway enslaved person. Um, and that uh, they lived in Concord near that site of that road. And particularly kids at Willard School would say, I know where Jenny Dugan Road is. I live there or near there, but I have no idea who Jenny Dugan is or was. Ohio Road is named after her. And that's just a road. Also, there's Jenny Dugan Meadow and Jenny Dugan Brook. I mean, it's quite a thing to have some place in Concord not named Emerson, Thoreau, Alcott, or Hawthorne, uh, all white men, by the way. And so this becomes a jumping off point, an invitation inquiry. Who was Jenny Dugan? And why is there a road named after her? And we could say the same about um, Peter Hutchinson or about Brister Freeman and so forth. And so through the course of this unit, uh, think, uh, kids are introduced. Like, for example, I might go in the classroom wearing this hat and kids will say, oh, I know who wears a hat like that, a pirate or George Washington. But eventually they realize maybe it's a Minuteman. And they learn that Caesar Robbins, uh, formerly enslaved uh, African-American, fought in the French and Indian War, and also was probably at the bridge on the 19th of April in 1775. And we begin to expand on that from primary sources. Uh, I won't go through all of it today, uh, tonight, uh, but in co collaboration with the Concord Museum, they do a wonderful program where the kids look at artifacts uh, that were similar to what the Dugans owned. Uh, Thomas Dugan was the third man of color to own property in Concord. So it's a story of a man who was property to one who owned property a man who was seen as an object to a man who now owned objects. He was a yeoman. In other words, he had his own land. And at his death, the probate inventory, the kids read that and what he had, he was basically a typical middle-class Concordian in the early 1800s. Um, we learn about different people in Concord, and I connect it more recently to the economics uh, standards that are in the state framework that the, the African-Americans who lived in Concord not only lived here, they worked here. Some sold products, some uh, made money by uh, providing services. And even though where they lived was really on the margins of town, uh, Peter Hutchinson lived near Great Meadows, the Dugans were near White Pond, 
Uh, Brister Freeman and his sister Zilpah White were near or in Walden Woods. Even though they were marginalized, nevertheless, they were an important part of the social fabric of the community. And so we bring that out. And the fact that Bronson Alcott writes in his journal, Peter Hutchinson plows my garden. Or Henry Thoreau writes in his journal at least three times about Peter Hutchinson and his knowledge of nature. So we learn about the African Americans who lived in Concord. We learn about women like Susan Robbins Garrison, uh, a woman of color who was one of the founding members of the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society. In their study of Henry Thoreau, we find out that his mother, his sisters, his aunts were also members of the Anti-Slavery Society, and Henry himself was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. They learn about Alcott's, and they learn that Louisa's mother, Abigail, was a member of the Anti-Slavery Society, and both Bronson, Alcott, and his wife were station masters on the Underground Railroad. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for kids to uncover and discover things about Concord history that has been not told very well or at all in the past. And from that, I think the kids really get an understanding that uh, anybody can make a difference and uh, how, how a whole community can work together to make that difference, either as individuals, as children. Uh, we learn about the Young People's Petition to President Lincoln uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation asking him to flip free all enslaved people. And so um, I think at second grade, it's an appropriate place to bring out that point that even you, a young child, can make a difference. And so um, the unit keeps expanding and evolving and developing. And um, it's probably one of my most favorite things I've ever worked on as an educator. Thanks, Bob. Next up, using diverse books in grade four, Amelia, Nancy, Julie, and Beth. Hi, my name is Julie Turner. I'm um, the librarian at Thoreau. And I'm happy to introduce this project. This started two years ago um, as a summer work project. It was um, a collaboration between people at Thoreau and Willard. Um, and we were looking to find a way to pinpoint um, a way to put in inclusive and diverse picture books across the fourth grade curriculum. So um, after a couple really fun days, we found 20 fantastic picture books. Um, we were looking for things that really touched on some of those highlights of fourth grade, immigration, regions, um, American Indians that are studied. And we were looking specifically for own voices books as much as possible, right? People of the race or ethnicity writing or illustrating about the group in the books. And so we were so lucky to have big support from Kristen Herbert. We were able to get 20 of these books. We have class sets that are shared um, across all three elementary schools. And now we're so lucky to be in the second year of them being used and loved. Hi, I'm Amelia Burns. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Thoreau. Um, and, oh, is this the slide? Where, I think, is there a different slide with some authors? Is there one more slide? More? No, oh, okay. Is it back? Back, back, back. There we go, thank you. Oop, this next one. <laughs> okay. Um, so back to what Julia was, Julie was saying about own, ver own voices authors, we thought it was really important just as we want those books to be in classrooms and to, you know, normalize the great diversity of this country, just as I think historically um, whiteness, able-bodiedness, um, you know, heterosexual uh, people were normalized and as a result othering all everyone else, um, we really wanted to show the authors as well. And so we made slideshows, we made lesson plans, including these slideshows. Some people I know, um, Kate Squire always prints these when she's presenting the books. Um, student teachers use these in different ways um, as interactive read alouds or woven into different curricular areas. But um, we here are a, an example of some of the authors of the books that you'll see in the next slides. 
Hi, my name is Beth Kalikstein. I'm a special education teacher at Thoreau. And with this project, we tried to find books that were written by diverse racial groups, in which the characters could be seen for their important contributions, and not always as the oppressed group. We also wanted to include books where groups are living more in the present day instead of in ancient history. So I'd just like to highlight one of the books that's on this slide. It's called Chester Nez and the Unbreakable Code. And it was a part of history that I had never known about before, and it was really exciting to learn about. And it's a true story of a Native American boy who had to leave his reservation and attend boarding school, where he was taught that his Native language and culture were useless. He refused to give up his heritage. During World War II, he was recruited with others by the U.S. Marines to use the Navajo language to create an unbreakable military code. The language he was told to forget helped to win World War II. In 2001, he was one of five living code talkers who received the Congressional Gold Medal from President George W. Bush. And this book really inspired the kids to learn more about the topic. Hi, I'm Nancy Dillon from Throw, and I've worked on numerous projects um, over the summers. And by far, I would say um, this is my favorite one. And I want to give special thanks to Kate Squire and John Smith, who inspired so much of this project. And this year I'm teaching a full year grade five remote academy. And I was really missing the books. And um, so I wanted to find out um, which of the books maybe they hadn't heard because of the, the lockdown. So I showed the kids about a week ago, every single book and asked them, you know, have you heard this one? Um, and sometimes I wonder if kids really find the books that we choose as adults as enjoyable and as powerful as we do. And I have to say it was the most heartwarming thing ever. As I showed each book, the children all said, that was the best book ever, or that sounds so wonderful. Please read it again. Um, so I'm really excited. I get to do all 20 books again this year. Thank you, Julie, Amelia, Nancy, and Beth. Next up, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, uh, Sharon Hine. Thank you, Andrew. So my name is Sharon Hain, and um, usually I am the ELA curriculum specialist from Willard School. Um, but this year, just like a lot of people everywhere are reinventing themselves, I am the grade four and five uh, remote academy teacher at Willard. So my thought was this year, I would love to find a book to read aloud that could cross curriculum areas and involve more than just reading um, other curriculum areas as well. So I came across this book titled The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. It's a true story and it's about a young boy at the time, he was young, um, named William Kim Kwamba. He's from Malawi and they had a terrible famine, uh, a terrible drought that struck their village, which then in effect caused a terrible uh, famine. His family lost all of their season's crops, leaving them literally with nothing to eat and nothing to sell. Um, William begins to explore science books in his village library looking for a solution. There he came up with the idea that he would change his family's life forever. He could build a windmill. So made out of scrap metal, old bicycle parts, William's windmill brought electricity to his home and helped his family pump the water they needed to farm the land. And that's a very short summary. This book is probably a great middle school reading. Kids could read this. At fourth and fifth grade, it's higher than their reading level, but it's not higher than their interest level or their ability to listen. So the way we do it every day, we read about 20 minutes aloud before they break for lunch. And it's amazing to look at those kids. They are so entranced in this book. So it's, it's written about a very diverse culture that faces very um, diverse challenges and challenges that, you know, the kids realize that we don't have to face here. And it's also written by the, the boy himself who was um, in, who is the true person involved in the story. As far as the curriculum areas go, it takes into account any of the things we work on with reading. For example, identifying character traits. There's so many for William. He's determined, he's loyal, he's compassionate to his family. He's loyal to his community. 
Um, he's resilient against all the challenges and his resourcefulness is something the kids admire. He goes to these scrap yards and just finds these things that are thrown away and he hunts for them. Um, and so there's, we work on cause effect and compare contrast. It's just, it's rich with this and science. They learn the scientific process of, first of all, you identify a problem and then you brainstorm and then you design something and then it's trial and error and then you go back and revise. And this is played out as he starts thinking about what he can design and actually create to maybe save his village and his family from starving. Um, and then it takes into account all the social emotional learning, perseverance and resiliency, resourcefulness, empathy. Um, you know, the other day when we were reading, we have some incredible discussions. It's amazing the discussions that these young fourth and fifth graders are having with this book. One of the fifth grade students said, you know, I really admire him because he really values his learning. He values education and he wants it so bad. He's prohibited from really going to school because they don't have enough money to send him to school. Um, and so he's self-taught. And she said, not everyone here thinks that. And it's kind of sad. And there's just so many themes that come up in the conversation. Um, so today, he was born in 1987, William. And today he went, he ended up going to Dartmouth College. He lives in North Carolina and he works for a nonprofit called movingwindmills.org, which funds Malawian run rural economic development and education projects. He's a TED Talk fellow. He's also an IDEO fellow, which stands for Innovation Design and Engineering Organization. He speaks throughout the United States as well as in other parts of the world. Um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful story that we're getting so much out of and an appreciation of the struggles that people living in other cultures have, um, as well as some similarities between all of us as human beings when we come across challenges and how we try to persevere and become resilient. It's recently been uh, made into a Netflix movie, and it's a great family movie, but the book is rich in detail. So I would highly recommend it. Thank you, Sharon. Music in grades four through eight, Anna uh, Anderson. Hi, so I put something quickly together because I was so excited about the work we're doing and I wanted to participate. Um, so I took a lot of courses this summer, including with Paula Martin and um, also on a lot of um, technical aspects of teaching on Zoom. And um, I am in the process of making um, a self-paced course um, that Terry Smolka was teaching us about. Um, how to on on black musicians who who are part of every tradition, classical and composers, female composers, and I've always incorporated a multicultural approach in my curriculum. And my curriculum is what we're performing, the pieces we're playing. And so in fifth grade, we do a lot of Japanese composers. And um, last year in sixth grade, we played a Chinese folk song. Um, and so this course, um, this is a self-paced course consisting of a few lessons, is going to introduce my students to Black performers, fiddlers, because it's a very rich tradition that even I didn't know about. I had to learn about, and that's exciting to discover all these facts. Um, so this year, when I recruited for fourth grade orchestra, I included a lot of uh, clips of black performers, Sheikh Okano Mason, who played at Coronation, or was it the wedding? I think it was the wedding, um, the royal wedding, um, and um, some young black children to inspire my students, and uh, the two black violin group, uh, and many others. Um, in sixth grade, we've been doing a, a lot of music history, and we've always taught about African Americans' roots. In music history and America wouldn't be, American music wouldn't be what it is without African-American roots that are in it, starting with um, 
spirituals and going through all the genres that lead to jazz in America. And uh, so it wouldn't sound the same way if it wasn't for um, Black musicians. Um, we use Ken Burns' jazz series excerpts from PBS and um, do a lot of handouts on Black musicians. Um, and I found these wonderful books about Black musicians that are pictured here. Um, on a side note, I wanted to say that, Colleen, when you showed the book on uh, Jonathan and Me by Erin Smalls, I actually know Jonathan. He was my ballroom dance partner and we competed um, dance competitively. So if you want me to put you in touch with his mother, who's the author, I could do that. That would be great. I know they're from around here, but I've never met either one of them. He's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Next up is Concord Middle School Mexico Achievement Strategies. Uh, Joe Meyer, uh, Deb Jemerson, Karen Baker, Catherine Curran. All right, so good evening all. My name is Joe Meyer. I'm a seventh and eighth grade social studies teacher at CMS. And I am one of three, thank you, Andrew, for giving those shout outs, one of three teachers who help run the Mexico Achievement Strategies program at CMS. Now, what is this program? This program is first and foremost a safe place for those uh, involved in the program. It's a, it's a study where we help the students with academics, self-advocation or self-advocating, and we're also teaching SEL. I think SEL is radically important for these students to process emotions for all students, really, to process the emotions of going through CMS, getting to know one another uh, so that when emotions that could hinder learning come up, we, know, we now know how to deal with them. Now we know how to self-advocate. I missed a test. I can write an email and understand. So this to us may seem pretty self-explanatory, but to students at CMS, Emailing a teacher who has been a veteran teacher for 25 years can be quite a daunting thing. So let's process those emotions. Let's draft the email. Make sure we're doing it in the way that's going to benefit us. Keeping track of executive functioning is a big part of the MECO Achievement Strategies Program. You know, what's due, when it's due, uh, how do we make sure as students, 7th and 8th graders, and sixth graders that we are factoring that into our calendars. What does that actually look like? So, okay, there's all this wonderful stuff in the curriculum, but let's get down to the nitty gritty. I'm at home at 7 p.m. I haven't been home since 7 a.m. and I'm exhausted. How do, I, how do I actually take care of what I need to take care of as far as academics goes? So that's uh, CMS MECO Strategies Achievement Program in a nutshell. And we're rebuilding it this year. And it really only happens at CMS, but we have a great team. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, literature choices in grades six, seven, and eight. Uh, Sarah Ogers, Bull and Co. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm speaking as the English department chair and a member of the Cultural Competency Committee and sort of a graduate of the MECO Achievement Program um, that Debbie Herman and I worked with for several years and glad to see it um, carrying on with Joe and Catherine and Karen Baker. Um, so a quick overview of looking at six through eight in the middle school. Um, over the past several years, we've made efforts to add several texts from diverse authors about diverse topics. But for the most part, those have been literature circle choice books. So there you can see um, just a representation from the different grade levels the Wanderer was a sixth grade text that was recently added. Um, Refugee and Outcast United in seventh grade. I am Malala, Claudette Colvin. The whole series of texts I'll talk about more specifically with each grade level. Um, but what we realized is we want it to be, in addition to these choice books, making sure that we have at least one core text that every student reads to have a common experience in talking about a non-dominant culture group. So our task has been this year during department meeting times to really review what it is we currently teach, what we are sort of willing to move away from and move toward with the goal of adding at least one core text per grade level. Um, 
And if, Andrew, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll start with talking about sixth grade. So in sixth grade, crash and seed folks have been sort of longstanding core texts, which both have different um, backgrounds at heart where the kids learn about and have different conflicts that they recognize and can see. And seed folks in particular is a multicultural text with lots of different community groups coming together to build a community garden. Uh, but the new text that they've just added and haven't even taught yet um, or looking forward to is called uh, Look Both Ways. It's Jason Reynolds, one of his new books. And it first started out as a summer read through the library. And we realized it was really a great text to do more with than just a summer read, but to sit and study. And what's nice about it is a collection of short stories, which, as some of the earlier presenters were talking about, just normalize the experience of being Black um, in America and living in a community. And each chapter is sort of a block on the way to school. And the school is the center of it. It's all, you know, middle school, just typical life um, for the students. But each of the different characters and families has normal <laughs> conflicts that the, the students are able to talk about. And it's written as J all Jason Reynolds books are with just a real eye toward engaging the middle school student. So we look forward to teaching it for the first time this year. Um, the sixth grade team was very grateful to have the professional day the other day where they spent the entire day really digging in deep to what that will look like. And they are very grateful with, for the opportunity to work with Dr. Martin um, to make sure that she's able to raise any blind spots that we might have as white educators um, in being sure we do justice to this book and to the students who will be reading it. And in seventh grade, yep. So in seventh grade, uh, the core text start with Home of the Brave, which is a refugee story told in conjunction with a documentary, God Grew Tired of Us. And along with that core text study, there's literature circle choices with different refugee experiences. And you can see some of those listed there, but it includes the Syrian um, story, um, Iraqi story, uh, The Outcast United is a wonderful nonfiction book with all different soccer players who come from all different refugee camps and sort of settled in the Southern United States and joined and created a soccer team. Um, and Inside Out and Back Again, there are some Asian and Haitian stories as well. So those are available. But what's super exciting and the seventh grade is currently in the middle of is the study of their new core text, uh, Ivy Aberdeen's Letter to the World. And this text was selected um, in direct response to the GSA club, a group of students under the supervision of Laura Regis last year put together an incredibly powerful video um, in which they described that they're glad that we're being culturally responsive to different racial and ethnic groups, but they, as the LGBTQ uh, community and allies, feel very invisible. So uh, we adopted this book, which has a sixth grade girl who's trying to figure out her feelings about her female friend. And again, in a very normalized kind of an experience um, where it's not just about that, it's about many other things, including the first chapter of her home gets destroyed in a tornado. So there's just lots of ongoing family dynamics um, as well as this exploration of what it might mean to be LGBTQ as part of that community and not even having to feel like you need to label what that means, but just exploring it as part of one's identity. So the book was chosen to create that safe space and to, to make visible those students in that community. Um, and we're very excited. Again, our team was able to work with Dr. Martin um, and they're in the midst of reading this book now. And I think it's going really, really well. Then in eighth grade, um, in eighth grade, this, our literature circle choices started several years ago, um, and it started with sort of justice-themed books where, like we've heard several of the presenters talk, we selected texts in which the protagonists, both nonfiction and fiction, were um, teenagers and created effective change in their communities and in the world. Things like I Am Malala, um, Claudette Colvin, um, all kinds of different stories where these teens were able to stand up for, to recognize their identity and stand up for marginalized people within those identity groups. Um, and part of that, that's been really fun and we're still trying to figure out how to do it this year in this um, environment is students then created 
picture books that we went down to the kindergarten and first grade classrooms and read those books about justice and about identity um, and social emotional learning. So that's still ongoing. We're figuring out how to tweak it, but it's been a lot of fun. After the justice theme books, we turned to the Holocaust, um, where that was moved out of the eighth grade social studies curriculum. We adopt it in the eighth grade English curriculum. And everyone reads the core text, The Sunflower, which begins by grounding students in the experiences, the, the true experiences of Simon Weisenthal, who was a um, Holocaust camp survivor. And we hear his story. And then the second part of the book is a symposium from which um, leaders, all different backgrounds from all around the world were asked by Weisenthal, would you grant forgiveness? And so it's an exploration of reconciliation and forgiveness from all different lenses um, that they're, they're exploring those topics. So it's looking, you know, supporting Jewish uh, identity, as well as all of those different identities that the people in the symposium and stu eighth grade students have remarkably insightful conversations about how perspective and how lived experience impacts how you might respond to that question. Um, and lastly, the theme that we've adopted in eighth grade for this year, we're still looking for a core text. We haven't landed on one yet, um, but we are, so that we don't miss it this year, asking all students to do their outside reading with that mirrors and windows framework in mind. In our first round, all students were asked to read a book um, that the protagonist and the setting and the, the ideas were from a culture and an experience that was not their own. So that was the window experience. And what they did with that text after reading it was they created podcasts where we took some of the SEL skills we've explicitly been teaching, um, either about respect for diversity or um, taking perspectives, and the students recorded their podcast about how one of those two skills impacted their ability to read and understand this book. Um, but they did it in that sort of casual um, podcast kind of way. And all of those are available on the library website. And we hope to do round two in a similar fashion where students then choose the mirror book in which you know the character represents who they are, or at least some part of their identity and helping making sure all students find those mirror books in the curriculum. So thank you. That's the middle school English. Amazing work. Thank you, Sarah. Next up is uh, grade eight social studies, uh, Sita uh, DeVrasula. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, eighth grade social studies went through a lot of changes in the last five years. We were members of the K through 12 social studies committee that looked at um, the upcoming, at that time, upcoming Massachusetts frameworks um, and looked at how we could better sort of uh, vertically align ourselves across the district. Um, and at the same time, um, we had to look at the facing history model that unit we were currently teaching and make a transition. And so what we landed on was a year of using the facing history model and the and the maintenance of this question of what conditions create a just society to now point that lens towards looking at US history. And we begin the year with the first two components of the facing history model of identity and then looking at we and they. And we begin, and it's the perfect start to the year looking at identity because we're introducing ourselves to each other and building a classroom community. And so um, I had the kids do identity charts. Uh, we look at the facing history model and kind of ask the question like, why are we beginning a year of history by talking about ourselves? Um, and we read what seemingly is a bedtime story, the bear that wasn't, but really has a lot of deeper layers um, that brings us into the vocabulary of stereotypes and assumptions and labels and sort of that outside identity that other people might place on us and that inside identity that how, of how we see ourselves and how we might do that, you know, whether it's through code switching or whether it's through um, trying to fit into stereotypes, um, how we might change our identity to fit into places. And so um, we dive even more deeply into those three ideas by having the kids um, look at the danger of a single story, um, think about stereotype threat, threat as identified by Dr. Claude Steele, um, and do some readings through the facing history 
um, book on Holocaust and human behavior that begins with this component and um, overlaps beautifully with English. And then um, we use a little satire, like what kind of Asian are you to look at kind of how silly sometimes labeling and assumptions can look. Um, and we use Dr. Steele's cartoon of street calculus, this idea of how we have little check boxes that we're not even conscious of and how unconscious bias might play a role in our identity development as well. Um, so all of these things, we then, um, you know, I, I wrap this up with a question for them. And this year with our um, morphed curriculum under these circumstances. I haven't had traditional assessments yet. And so instead, it's been a lot of thinking questions and with the theme of looking deeply. And I asked them, let's go back to that first question you had. What does all this have to do with looking at history? So I asked them to use that vocabulary and start thinking about how this might shape how we see history and what we need to hear or study in order to get a better, more complete picture of our own history and what shaped the American identity. Um, and then if you don't mind going to the next slide. The next unit is we and they. Um, and this component of facing history, the kids like plug into right away because I think, you know, in middle school life, there's so much of we and they that's easy for them to put their finger on. Um, and I asked them, how does separation occur and how does that you know, create even more of a sense of we and they? And I also introduced them to the idea of universe of obligation. So we have some introductory poems um, that we break down and we watch a class divided and we have some thinking questions and some discussion again this year with the alternative model that we've had. Um, discussion looks very different when kids are masked up and they're in smaller groups they are so reticent to speak in class. Um, I'd like to tell you that they're enthralled with my performance in front of the classroom and that's why they're dead silent. But really it's because I think it is so weird for them um, to sit in there with masks on and I can't really see their expressions very well. So we found lots of different alternative ways to have these conversations, whether it's jam boards or um, I don't know, the kids are really creative, like Google Slides that we put into breakout rooms, and they have brought in so many insightful ideas about um, why the brown-eyed and blue-eyed experiment from a class divided can be applied to so many other situations that they see in the history curriculum. Um, and so um, then we went into the universe of obligation, and I did it through like a fun sort of catchy Spider-Man story, but then we dived into looking at it more deeply by looking at the story of the Navajo water lady um, and also Greta Thunberg. So I asked them like, what does their universe of obligation look like? What defines their universe? And what does what is our nation or our world's universe of obligation when it comes to issues of equity and justice with access to water for the Navajos or when it comes to um, climate change? And then we take that a step further. And so Concord School Committee, you should expect a very large packet in your mail coming up because Again, as an alternative assessment, um, I asked the kids to write a letter after they studied primary sources, Columbus's journals, um, the letters of the friar that uh, traveled with him, um, some facing history readings, and make an argument as to whether or not Columbus Day should remain Columbus Day on the Concord School calendar or whether it should be changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. And so I'm happy to tell you I have over 200 letters in the mail coming to you. <laughs> Um, making an, this argument and they do it through the lens of we and they, right? So whose story is told when we celebrate Columbus Day and whose story um, should be told um, through that holiday? And so um, they make wonderful arguments and I'm looking forward to hearing your reactions to those letters. So if you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, and finally, also um, another committee um, that the district put together was the K through 12 African-American history committee. And through that committee, um, Bob Farty did a wonderful job of um, giving us an overview of a lot of that work. So eighth grade tries to take the foundation that is uh, placed at the elementary school level and extend it a bit further and make connections into our curriculum. And um, our work on rewriting um, our curriculum on um, chattel slavery in the United States was actually covered by the Washington Post a couple of years ago in an article they wrote about how that curriculum is covered nationwide. And they profiled a couple of our teachers. Um, and we begin looking at this with this case study of Anthony Johnson. And 
the evolution of race-based slavery in the Virginia colony. Um, and I actually asked the kids to look at Universe of Obligation again and, and think about what was Virginia, how did you, Virginia's Universe of Obligation change over the course of Anthony Johnson's life when it came to um, Africans living in the colony? Um, would they start looking at slavery in Concord by thanks to the curriculum through the Robbins House? And um, um, then we are going to be moving into the Constitution. Constitutional Convention and asking the question, how did the Constitution, Constitution directly and indirectly protect slavery? Um, and again, bringing up that question of universal obligation, right? Um, with the Concord Museum, um, we've been able to create two different projects. Um, we look at Free African Americans and the Robbins House by looking at the story um, of a family that occupied that house. Um, and actually one of our teachers, Robbie Robbins, um, has a family connection to that story. So that's wonderful for the kids. Um, and uh, with the Concord Museum, we were able to create reproductions of primary source objects. So the kids can look at the diversity of the abolitionist movement as it existed in Concord and elsewhere, um, and look at the choices to make of armed and nonviolent resistance. And this idea of resistance, again, overlaps with ELA's Holocaust, Holocaust unit. Um, with this idea of looking at um, upstanders and choosing to participate. And finally, um, through Facing History, we have the Reconstruction Unit, which is our anchor unit for the year. And we look at the power of laws, like the 14th, 15th, and 15th, sorry, 13th, 14th, and 15th. This is why I don't teach math. Um, and we look at the, I, the themes of unity and division. And most importantly, the existence of an interracial democracy in this country that is rarely covered in our curriculum uh, prior to more recent years. And uh, luckily for us, so many books have come out recently that we can use to as a, a basis of our study of that. Um, and I didn't put on the slide, but one more piece. Uh, Laura Regis and I um, recently organized an outside reading group with our eighth graders to read Stamped together, um, because I'd like to preview it as a possibility of folding it into our eighth grade year, because it's sort of a perfect match for what we're covering this year. So thank you so much for letting me do the back to school night version of the entire eighth grade year um, in a few minutes, and um, looking forward to hearing more. Thank you, Sita. Next up is uh, eighth grade science and science clubs, Sharon Staggers Moss. Good evening. Um, I, you know, teaching science, you have to be very careful when you try to incorporate any kind of diversity type of things because it can seem not very authentic. It's like we're studying this and now let's bring in people of color. So what I do instead is try to make it really authentic. And I want to model what I want the kids to know and to represent. So basically I have right here um, a copy of my beginning of the year out of the student notebook a flashcard that they fill out with information and to honor my students who are LGBTQ, which um, I feel is really important, is to ask their personal pronoun that they want to be used and to acknowledge that I, rep I recognize and see them. And so that's how I begin the year. What I have outside of my classroom is um, famous quotes. And I have uh, one of my favorite um, persons, Neil deGrasse Tyson's quote, I always begin the school year with his quotes. And I change the famous quotes about once a month. My famous quotes include women, people of color, um, Katherine Johnson, who is, was one of my um, famous quotes. Um, if you don't know who she is, she was the person who was played by Taraji P. Henson in the movie Hidden Figures. Um, right here to the lower left is what my Zoom waiting room looks like. And I figured sometimes the kids have to wait a while. So I want them to know that when they enter my classroom, this is a safe place for everyone. And also, I want to recognize and have my some of the people who are my famous quotes right there. And sometimes we talk about them. We um, we go over what they're talking about. We talk about the role of women and people of color and how sometimes they would work just as hard on on things and not get the credit. The credit was always given to um, 
the white person. And so then you'll see at the bottom what I call my desk biographies. After taking the class this summer, I wanted to figure out how can I incorporate people who, of color who also um, contributed to the things that we're learning. And what you see are, I researched people who, um, we're starting the genetics unit that's on, on heredity and adaptation. So I went deep and wrote about six biographies. These are three of the six. And I chose, um, I can't read it because it's small, but I do have my copy. Um, I chose er Ernest Everett Just, who was really famous. Um, he didn't get a chance to really do the kind of work he wanted to because he existed and lived in the 1930s and 40s. He started teaching at Howard University at the age of 21. He was considered an outstanding geneticist. But because he lived in this country, he wasn't allowed to do the research that he really loved. I also focused in on this time, Janaki Amal, who in India is like the, the most famous scientist in India. There are numerous awards named for her, and she worked in the field of genetics and cytology. Uh, who you don't see is Marie M. Daly, who is the first black African-American woman in the United States to earn a PhD in chemistry at uh, Columbia University in 1947. I do, you do see Nettie Stevens, and the reason why I chose her for this is that she has a local connection. She graduated from high school at Concord, uh, not Concord Academy, excuse me, Westford Academy. But what she's known for is that she deter she um, was the one who figured out that the last two chromosomes was not an uh, X chromosome and then a deformed chromosome. She actually said, hey, that's an X and that's determining the sex. So she's the one that came up with the idea that there were sex-linked chromosomes and the XY chromosome. Um, she was not given credit in her life. The, the um, Nobel Prize went to a male colleague, but since then, um, she's been given credit for that discovery. And finally, I want to know, I believe in practicing what I preach. So this is a holiday playlist and I, from 2015 that I play today. And it, um, this time of year, we play a lot of music. I try to in class while the kids do work. And um, I realized that it didn't really represent the kids. I was looking at the kids and it really didn't represent the kids that I was looking at. So I did some research and I got Diwali, I got Chinese New Year, I got um, Hanukkah, of course, Kwanzaa and Christmas. And I did have for Muslim um, Ramadan, but uh, since I made the playlist, the Ramadan song was banned from the United States after 2015. And I was kind of a little disappointed in that. So I've shared this with my colleagues, and many of them really like the idea of the desk biographies. And what I mean by the desk biographies is that I wrote the biographies, um, printed it, laminated them, and taped them on the individual desk of, of the students so that if they had any free time, and many of them asked about who are these people, I go, well, read about them. And we discussed the, you know, them, and they thought it was cool that it wasn't just who they hear about in their textbooks, but there are a lot of people that also contributed to the field of heredity and adaptation or genetics. So we're about to finish the genetics unit, and I'm in the process of now doing the same for the planetary science or astronomy unit. So um, that's just a little bit of something that we're working on, and I've been working on myself in um, eighth grade science. Thank you, Ms. Moss. You're welcome. Next up, in, uh, grade nine English, weaving in diverse writers and student choice, Shell Hall. Hi, everyone, and thanks for this opportunity pr to present. And it's fascinating hear all, hearing all the work that's going on in the other schools. Um, what I'm going to share here is just a snapshot of how um, I decided to rework and re envision the beginning of school. Um, all these have live links, so I'll not put you through the ringer here, Andrew, with having you go to all of them, except maybe at the end, if that's okay. But the opening poems, I'm going to start actually at the bottom. Um, 
So in the past, I've started with the book Kindred, which is by Octavia Butler. She's a black science fiction writer. She was really a pioneer and broke barriers. Um, the book happens to be uh, have a black woman as a protagonist, and she gets pitched back in time to the t time of slavery. So um, I felt that that was really sort of a hard way to start to kind of grapple with slavery right at the beginning of the year. We are going to read that book. But I wanted to meet students kind of where they're at. We're in a really difficult, you know, unprecedented time. And these two poems uh, really help address the darkness um, just sort of in general about being a human being in the world. But they meet that darkness with a lot of humanity. Uh, Naomi Shihab Nye is an Arab American poet, and she has a poem called Shoulders. And then Danusha Lamaris is a woman of color, and she has a poem called Small Kindnesses. And it's sort of about the importance of small kindnesses and empathy and um, meeting people with humanity. And um, it actually, I actually asked students to write their own poems about small kindnesses, and it gets us talking about and um, the end lines of poems, the line breaks, and whether they're jammed, which just means you have to go on to the next line to understand the meaning of that line, or if their end stop just means that you can read to the end of the line and kind of get the gist of what's happening. Um, so they wrote those poems um, and tried out their different line breaks. And then we transitioned into, um, they got a choice. So what you see here is a choice board, um, option one, two, three, four, and five, and those columns go straight down. Um, the one thing that's linked here where it says and student choice is actually I had a Google form for the class got to decide on the spot which one of those options they wanted to do collectively as a class. So I had four different sections. I was really curious to see what they would choose. If you kind of skim those um, different topics, you, you're, I'm not going to give you all the pitches for them, but you might be, I don't know if you'll be surprised to learn yeah. that they picked um, option three, which was actually to to hear a poem by Dr. Maya Angelou, Still I Rise, and then to watch a video of her talking about meeting the rapper Tupac Shakur, which a lot of students actually know who that is, um, and wanted to, we're kind of curious about this black kind of grandmotherly figure, what happened when she met him. I'll, I'll maybe spoil it a little bit and tell you that by the end of that meeting, he's weeping. So that, I think that, that probably caught their attention, and all four of my classes chose option three to do collectively as a class, which was perfect because later on we read, um, we actually heard uh, Dr. Angelou recite her um, A Brave and Startling Truth poem, and if you've not heard her read that poem, please Google it and watch her. It's at the 50th anniversary of the United Nations that she reads it, and is just incredibly powerful. So that was actually, they didn't know a perfect setup for that, reading that future poem and studying that a little bit more closely. And then after they read um, the, we watched a Google Doodle and it was just amazing. It's an animated version of the Still I Rise poem and the, this famous actresses like America Ferreira, um, singer Alicia Keys and others reading parts of that poem. We read a biography about her and um, they were pretty, they were really enthralled by that. Um, and especially the video of her talking about meeting Tupac. After that, um, they actually got to choose individually what they wanted to choose from this board. And lots of students chose number one. We'd already read, and probably many of you have heard of the poem, We Real Cool by Gwendolyn Brooks. There's a video there. Um, animating that that poem and Gwendolyn Brooks, you can probably see her there with her gray hair and glasses, um, typing up the poem. It's a really it's a really charming video. It's a great way to get students kind of involved in poetry is to have some videos. Um, if you were to scroll down, Andrew, if that's possible, I guess you can't. So I because I, I think that's a Sorry. link to a Padlet. Yeah. Um, but if you were to scroll down under We Real Cool, it has uh, a poem called American Sunrise by Poet Laureate Joy Harjo. She's an American Indian. Um, and actually, that poem um, has, you can see, is inspired by We Real Cool. 
Yeah, so thanks, Andrew. Sorry. If you go to the first column, there's like a little, um, yep, if you scroll down. So th there's Joy Harjo. Um, and lots of students actually picked this option, was to look at both of these poems and to see how American Sunrise echoes and is um, really inspired by We Real Cool, but has also a, a different message um, that is more about the American Indian experience. Um, also, here you'll see E. e. Cummings is there. He's sort of a um, well-known modern white male poet. Um, so these poets are right alongside those kind of more um, traditional poets that are maybe more well-known in some ways. So instead of them being having our diverse writers being peripheral, they're centered here and they're part of the choices that students can make. That's uh, also lots of students chose a poetry for teens. I don't know if you can click in there, the poetry for teens. Andrew, thanks so much. Sorry, I'm putting you to work. No worries. Um, but this, if you scroll down, um, has, this is, there's some really great, you know, part of my job is to find good resources that meet students where they're at. And you can see their poems, um, Heritage and Identities, the third one down in the first column. Second one down is Gender and Sexuality. So students here get a choice. And interestingly, some of them came across Joy Harjo through looking at this site. So they got to Joy Har Harjo by way of this other um, opportunity. If you don't mind going back to the slideshow, Andrew, thank you so much. Um, and then, so hopefully this is just a snapshot of ways we can uh, weave in different voices and give students choice and have them feel good about um, learning about diverse writers. If you don't mind, lastly, Andrew, clicking on the sample student reflection. Uh, I do have Brian Tilford's permission to share this publicly with the school committee. But um, this was just a real life example of how students processed this activity and what they thought about it. So I'm just going to read um, the second one, if that's all right. Uh, this is Brian Tilford's words. He, he actually chose option one, which was to compare We Real Cool and American Sunrise by Joy Harjo. So that was great to see him pick that. He writes, An American Sunrise by Joy Harjo definitely took much inspiration from We Real Cool by Gwendolyn Brooks. First off, the very direct inspiration that an American Sunrise uses similar phrases or even identical lines from all throughout We Real Cool. Both talk of pool players, both talk of singing and sin. Thin and Jen occur very close to each other. Jazz and June are both mentioned and both end with die soon. They also occur in the same order throughout each poem and every pair occurs near to each other or within the same sentence. Both poems follow a similar thread of rogue youths as I see it, but We Real Cool simply seems to speak of misguided, rowdy youths, whereas American Sunrise seems to speak of more mature and passionate youths, both end with a heavy line. But in We Real Cool, it was sad and dark, whereas in American Sunrise, it was hopeful and progressive. In conclusion, American Sunrise most certainly took heavy inspiration from We Real Cool and could even be considered an homage to it. But though they both follow similar narratives, they have very differing tones. So it was um, just an example of the kind of work students are doing in our classroom and incorporating diverse voices. Um, this is just a snapshot. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Uh, CCHS English, Kate Fleming. I'm on mute. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Kate Fleming. I'm the chair of the English department. Shelley, thank you so much. I'm just thinking how I memorized We Real Cool when I was in high school. We strike straight, right? Um, so I just wanted to talk about two new books that we brought into the curriculum recently, Everything I Never Told You and Homegoing by Yagi Yassi. Um, I teach Homegoing, so I would just say that it's been wonderful to teach a text that looks at the history of slavery starting in Ghana and, uh, twin sisters that diverge. One remains in Ghana, one is sold into slavery and, and it comes full circle long, long uh, descendants eventually meet in the end. But I think it speaks beautifully to the African experience of slavery and uh, the lasting history of it there. So to me, it's actually a revolutionary text um, in terms of what we teach to kids when we talk to them about uh, slavery in, in literature. 
Um, our goal is always to have a weir, um, window and a mirror book in every grade level, level and we continue to work on that um, and build in new texts um, from Chinese American authors, um, et cetera. Our focus is on cultural competency in every single text that we teach. Um, we've been working closely with the CCHS Anti-Racism Racism Curriculum Review Committee um, that Shelley Hall and uh, Jenny Blounts and Johanna Glazier have been working on. And it's just a great way to talk about what we are already teaching and the lens through which, which we are looking at these texts um, with other teachers uh, and social studies teachers to see places where we intersect. So um, it's uh, great work and, and we're very excited about doing it. And you know, we're a bunch of English teachers continuously reading books and trying to figure out what we can bring next that will really resonate with students. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kate. CCHS Social Studies, Samantha Fox Morrow. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, it's been great listening to all of these, all of my colleagues and all of the different buildings doing such inspiring work. I actually wrote down some of the texts from the middle school for my own children. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of uh, the social studies curriculum, um, cultural competency is really part of the DNA of what we teach and how we think about our collective human past. It's, it used to be often a short blurb on the side of a textbook that had the sort of, and there are women, or and there are African-Americans too. And we have clearly abandoned that approach to history. Um, so we're not looking at standalone moments or adding people in a, as a sort of, a, a, just a topic um, either of a horror or a celebration. We're really trying to weave in different voices into the cloth of the past that we evaluate. Um, so in the ninth grade curriculum, the world cultures class, uh, world cultures and civilizations, we're really examining the universal human experience um, and we look at, and it used to be a very Eurocentric curriculum, and we've expanded to look at the history in India, China, the Middle East, and the Silk Road. And there's a real focus, not just on those individual civilizations, but on how people interact, what happens when civilizations come in contact with each other, how do they influence each other, how do they see each other. Um, and um, so for an example, um, the, they look now at the um, expansion of the role of people of African descent in Renaissance Europe. They've also um, uh, uh, modified the unit on the transatlantic slave trade, which used to look more just at the, at the trade itself, but now looks at the civilizations of West Africa um, and um, looks at the experiences of the enslaved people. Um, and uh, so the entire curriculum is trying to question how uh, the traditional stories of history that were defined um, by the sort of great white men, and that that's not the story that we that we look at. Those aren't the voices that we listen to. They're not the only voices that matter in the way that we consider the world. It's truly a world cultures curriculum now. Um, in 10th grade, we have U.S. history, a required class, and we've been working and tweaking over the last few years, um, trying to um, provide more depth in the way we deal with marginalized communities um, and the, the conflicts that are created around various groups within our uh, society. Um, and uh, still maintain some level of, of uh, um, being able to cover some time sweep because it is a survey class. Um, what we did is we redid the, the first unit to focus on America as an experiment, as, an, uh, as a republic, and then to examine the ways different voices and cultures contribute to the United States and to society as they adopt and question its values and force us all to confront the values of liberty and equality and what they really mean and what it looks like when they're actually applied and when they're not. Um, 
So it provides more of a context for current debates around things like statues, the naming of military bases, the names on college campuses. Um, and um, in each subsequent unit, we try to integrate major developments that are happening on a national level with um, and, and the challenges that the nation faces, things like World War I, but then look at how it affects various groups within society and how there's a dialogue between different communities and individuals with the larger um, events that are taking place over the course of American history. Um, and so when we look at immigration, for example, we're looking at, at immigration of various different groups, how they, what the experience meant to them, how they changed the face of our nation. Um, and I mean that literally and figuratively. Um, and so, for example, we were just talking about um, Chinese immigration, what it meant, what the experience was like for them at Angel Island. Um, and look the discrimination against them with the Chinese Exclusion Act, but also looking at how they resisted the classification and the denial of rights, how they used the court system to try to regain a voice and to hold on to those rights. So there's that dialogue around what America means and everyone gets a voice. Um, and we use different cases to make that point. That's only one of the cases. Um, in our elective program, juniors and seniors get to choose their electives. Um, we have history electives and social science electives that are also trying to bring um, cultural competency and anti-racism into a more central place in our teaching. Um, for example, the psychology program does a unit on implicit bias. Um, our sociology curriculum looks at the construction of identity of race of, of gender, of sexual identity. Um, our current affairs class does a whole unit on the criminal justice system and using the Innocence Project as a centerpiece. So there are lots of things um, throughout the curriculum where we're trying to be more self-aware about making some of the things that we've talked about in the past more prominent and connecting them to larger uh, trends to give students um, a way to see U.S. history through a different lens. Mm -hmm. So the goal is so that we're evaluating the past and constructing a narrative of American history that's more inclusive, but that's also open to the students to question, to bring their own ideas, their own perspectives, and their own identities to interact with the past that we are examining. So thank you very much. Thank you, Samantha. CCHS Art, Tracy Dunn, collaboration with Joe Pickman. Hi, everybody. Um, let's see, I will echo Samantha with saying I'm really impressed with everything I'm hearing. And um, it's rare that we get to see or have sight lines K through 12 like this to really appreciate how it all builds. Um, and actually, uh, Samantha and Tracy Davies at the high school had done a day after the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where they invited people to participate in reading statements um, about her and by her. And it's a really interesting way to bring faculty and students and anyone who showed up into current events and to experience some of what Samantha was just describing, um, letting us sort of question and be a part of it. So, and one of the reasons I attended that, um, I don't know that that service of sorts for Ruth Bader Ginsburg is because I was working with Joe Pickman on a collaborative installation in our gallery at the high school. And we were taking pieces of her life story to help students reflect on their life story and think about um, sort of their position in society and what it means to leave a legacy behind. Um, and this was also the beginning of the school year. So the goal of the project was to create a, a safe learning community. And um, again, just borrowing from her life story to open up a little bit more about ourselves. So for example, um, we looked at notable numbers and a notable number in Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life was nine out of 500. And it says in the 1950s, Ginsburg went to Harvard Law School where she was one of nine women in a class of 500 students. 
So nine out of 500 is a significant or notable number in her life. And then asking students, have you ever um, noticed perhaps that you're, you were underrepresented somewhere? Is there a notable number somewhere in your life um, that you could use to understand what it felt like to be uh, a marginalized or peripheral person? So students would actually reflect on that. And then these blocks were a chance for them to consider their identity through perhaps a notable number or a story in their past where they had to overcome rejection um, or they were feeling out of sync or out of lockstep with the people that they were around. Um, so I liked, I actually was looking through this presentation earlier and I'm not sure I fully understood till hearing today what that mirror and window piece was all about, but I, I liked the language. And so I borrowed it to say we were using Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a, a, as a window into what it was like for women in the 1950s. Um, and then looking, you know, so what is the, how do we hold up the mirror to what it's like for us in today's world? Like wh where do we see change that we need to work towards? Um, so yes, and also I've heard a lot of conversation around building awareness uh, of identity and how do we do that at the high school level, building awareness and informed identities that um, builds on some of what you've done in the previous years, but starts to catch up to current events and where they are as teenagers. Uh, and a lot of that comes through listening and learning from classmates. I think there's certainly a way in which school can turn you inwards and start thinking that your peers might be your competitors rather than people that are members of your community. So I put together this idea of a socially distanced block party and we looked at what is a block party and where do people have them and um, what is the value in them and um, so why is it that maybe with our classmates, when they're speaking, we just assume they're talking to the teacher, but we're not spending time listening and getting to know one another's identities as well. So this project was a way for them to have a, a block party of sorts where the block has six sides and each side uses, um, the life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a way to, um, have a window into someone else's life and then to look back at your own and then share that with others and really listen to one another's stories. So this is a very common in contemporary art to be using um, interdisciplinary subjects. And in this case, I suppose it fell somewhat under social studies or civic engagement. Um, and it helped the students to sort of explore their own personal stories and build better relationships in the classroom. And then eventually it was all hung. What you're looking at here, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's an empty frame and there's glasses that represent um, our Ruth Bader Ginsburg's glasses and then her collar of descent. And you can essentially walk up behind that frame and sort of have a moment looking through her eyes. And then all the blocks that the students made based on their identity are hanging around her and thinking about how her life um, and her legacy might be impacting their identity and their story. And then we were collaborating with Joe Pickman's class, which was doing the two dimensional piece that lays in the background and just sort of seeing like, how did his class interpret some of this material in ours and how did we visually express ourselves and what do we choose to put out to the world? Um, and the last thing that I have here is, yeah, just helping students. Oh yeah, the idea of legacy, helping students. Um, it's kind of interesting in this conversation, even here this evening, you know, we, we invest in these students at age five and six and kindergarten all the way through. And then by the time we have them at the high school, we want them to start to reflect on sort of how have they been a part of this, this school system and what have they contributed? What have they learned? What might they be critical of? Um, and this is a project that's all about that sort of reflection. So in the arts department, I I'm, I'm new to it. I was in Rivers for a very long time. So I'm still learning all the other um, members of the department in their curriculum, but I see everybody doing this sort of work where we're all responding to current events and having students find ways to not just learn about them, but to also find ways to express their own um, their own perspectives on them and, and to think about what an audience might be gleaning about them and about the world through their eyes as artists. And that's it. Thank you, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, Jamie Andrade on CCHS Rivers and Revolutions. Uh, 
Um, so uh, I'm going to share what Rivers um, has been doing so far this year. Uh, so Tracy was um, teaching art for Rivers and I have the privilege of taking over and the curriculum um, is a windows and mirrors curriculum already. And uh, Rivers decided to take a step back when COVID hit and just really think about what can we do in a meaningful way um, with so many unknowns. Um, and Black Lives Matter and COVID-19 were, were front and centered every newsreel and, you know, um, personal conversations. And we thought, why don't we slim down our curriculum and make it be about the kids, what the students are thinking about, what they're talking about, what they're worried about, what they want to know more about. So Rivers um, trimmed down five units to three. So we have Rivers, Revolutions, and Love. So Rivers is about building relationships um, within your community and beyond. Revolutions is about analyzing systems and love is about introspection. And so within each of those, specifically in the content, uh, rivers and relationships, we're looking at modern day civil rights. So what is it, what does Black Lives Matter mean? And what, um, what's the context that it's in? Um, and for revolutions, we are looking at educational equity um, especially in this time of COVID, how, you know, schools around the globe are handling the pandemic. And then with love, um, we will be looking at climate change more uh, closely. And so how do we weave all of these large ideas into a program that essentially takes students out every day and looks at the beautiful and wonderful history of Concord? And so we made a commitment this year to do windows and mirrors in every piece of material that we present to students and to go outside every day. So Rivers has been outside since we started in September. Um, the last two weeks, I think we hiked an average of eight miles. We've gone to uh, Fairhaven Bay, Great Meadows, all the way out to De Cordova. And we've been able to hit on all these themes. So these are just a few examples. And actually these happen more in the beginning of our program. So we visited Egg Rock. Um, we use difficult conversations by Pat and Stone and Heen, which it, are really tools um, in developing relationships between the students themselves. But then we make connections between the settlers and the indigenous group that was here. So we talk about how Concord was founded on Nipmuc land and what that means. Um, we have Dr. Angelou's A Rock, A River, and A Tree um, that really launches the whole Rivers unit. The Robbins House, um, it served as a great backdrop to investigating the artwork of Jacob Lawrence. Um, and then we made this awesome connection with Steve Locke. He's a contemporary artist who um, lived, worked, in Boston and recently left uh, for Pratt, he wrote about Jacob Lawrence's piece and he was actually my professor at MassArt before he left um, and is doing amazing civil rights work. Um, and then we have the Robbins House uh, just released their Black History walking tour and it just so happens to meet up with the locations that we already visit. So weaving that there. Uh, we brought Brister Spring more to the forefront in the curriculum than I think it has been in the past and making more explicit connections between water and freedom and then bringing, so all of these uh, sites in Concord represent something that has happened in the past and we bring it forward to the present with Toni Morrison's Bench by the Road and then we actually visit the Bench by the Road. And Mike Prado did an amazing um, piece through the math lens about um, the intersection of how the pandemic is affecting our communities and uh, its relationship to wealth accumulation and what that means in terms of finances, stock market, how communities are able to have the resources to navigate things like this and so forth. Um, we 
talk about Concord abolitionists, um, we visited the graves of Sanborn, Peabody, and Alcott, and it actually, um, it spurred them, it spurred the students to talk about educational equity in their experience and their role as students in the school. Uh, and we, you know, visit Thoreau's Night in Jail, that location, um, and all of these sort of uh, contextual conversations that we're building set the stage for um, students to debate more modern ideas. So um, one of the conversations we recently had was around America's monuments. So what what kinds of um, monuments do we have? You know, Columbus, I, I've heard brought up a couple times. Um, do we want to honor Columbus? And if so, why, where, how? We look at the war memorials in Concord as well. Um, and the students may have an opportunity um, to take all of what they're learning with all of these units and put it into practice. So Tony Williams, um, he's the founder of the Urban Nutcracker, and he's working with the umbrella to uh, put on a performance um, of the historical roots of Black Lives Matter with a focus, with a focus on Concord's abolitionist movement um, and Black history. And so uh, I met a few ballerinas of color who said, you know, Tony Williams' program uh, is amazing. You know, he lets ballerinas wear, you know, tights that match their skin color and uh, things like that. And to he, he really wants to get into a lot of the topics the students are getting into from, you know, uh, K to eight and eight and beyond. And so Tony Williams is really um, interested in hearing the student's point of view on Concord's uh, African-American history and abolitionists to take a more modern approach on history that can feel at times cliche um, or old and really bring it into the present. And so we are working on how that will all pan out, um, but it could be an amazing opportunity for students to kind of pull all these pieces together um, and put it into practice and, and, and see, uh, see something come of all of these conversations that we've been having either virtually or out in the field. Wonderful. So uh, that closes out our curriculum portion. Um, and I think usually at this moment, people would thank uh, all of our 22 presenters tonight because they put a tremendous amount of work in here. Um, and I'm just, uh, you know, I've been a part of all this work, um, but to see it all presented together is just makes your heart burst. Really, I wanna say thank you to school committee because seeing it all together um, you know, you asked to see it, um, and so uh, we are happy to, to share with you, and um, I, I'm just so proud of what we're doing. Uh, so uh, I think, I don't know if there's time for questions, but. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I, like uh, Samantha, I took down notes of things for, for my 7th and 10th graders to read and, and for stuff for myself to, to look more into. Um, and so, and that was great. I think that what we've seen here is, I mean, as, as Paula had, had said earlier, you know, a, a commitment, right? A, a, a commitment to conversation, to action, not just lip service, but really um, to making a difference. And, and, and as, uh, as Bob said, you know, doing these threads throughout, throughout the year, but not just throughout one year, but throughout all of the years, um, together. Um, and I, I think it's really impressive how it all is fitting in well together. And it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just isolated, let's now switch to this. It's it's really saying, this is us, right? And and this is who we are, and let's all be represented everywhere um, through the through the course of the curriculum. So so thank you so much. I, I don't think I have any questions, just thanks. Um, but I will ask the fellow committee members. Um, if uh, for thoughts, comments, questions, anything.
I just want to react. I'm blown away. Um, and I've been hearing about, you know, the beginnings of different efforts for m many years now and have seen little things here and there. Um, and as Laurie says, I know this isn't even the big picture between seeing the students last time and this, that's the start of it. But this is way more action than I could have imagined. And I know it's been going on, but to see it in person and to hear all of you talking about what you're actually doing and to think about it class by class and student by student, the impact that you're making, it is mind boggling. And I really am blown away. And I'm so thankful for all of the work that's going on. Um, and it helps me to realize to, to some extent why and how all the students who presented last time felt so empowered and enabled and safe to have the conversations they're having because all of this is the, the curriculum pieces are incredible and it's not just the curriculum. It's how this curriculum and these, the, the, the safe spaces that you're creating enable a whole different environment, which is what we're trying to get to. So, wow. Just thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I would offer up. I'm I'm hugely encouraged. Uh, also exhausted because I didn't want to miss a word. And uh, you know, you 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 covered uh, K twelve. Um, I thought beautifully, and I'm glad this is being recorded for the larger community. And I know that we have community members who dialed in specifically to hear you tonight. So thank you so much for putting all of this in one place. Um, I, I have a few questions, but I'm going to reserve it to one. Um, I, I get the sense that uh, most students, most of the time, trust the wisdom of their teachers and their elders generally. Uh, and as you make curriculum redesigns and uh, reprioritize an emphasis here or there, and maybe uh, students take it for granted that it's just so. Uh, but maybe not. I, uh, so my question is, to, to what degree uh, are students, and this may be grade level specific, but to what, what extent are students aware that this school district is executing on a very specific, conscientious, explicit strategy? Uh, are they aware of that? Or, or uh, uh, I fear, uh, are they confused that this is a reaction to the horrors of last summer? Um, do they know that this is a system-wide, long-term commitment? Can, could anybody help speak to that? I can start um, because I think it's different for different age kids um, about how explicit we've been. Um, and I will say, I, I think all of us uh, teachers and administrators have felt um, encouraged. I think the, the seed has been there to do this for a long time. Um, but because of the school committee's support and Dr. Hunter's support, um, I, I think everyone felt like that seed could, could blossom and, um, and it was okay. Uh, in fact, it was encouraged for teachers to talk explicitly with students about why we were why we are investigating identity, why we are trying to be more inclusive of other voices. Um, but I'd love to hear from educators about how you do that, um, you know, because it's different for Colleen in kindergarten, um, Sharon in eighth grade, and uh, folks at the high school. Um, I'm not sure if my five and six year olds know about the long term. Uh, goal here, but I do know that parents are because I get a lot of positive feedback that they can't believe the discussions we're having and it comes up at dinner and clearly I do have a long-term goal in mind and it does continue on first grade and beyond. So I know the parents are aware of it. Bob, you're on mute. My family loves me when I'm on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just respond to what Court asked. I think um, I would say that we've been more proactive than reactive to what's happened through this, this past summer. And uh, I, I'll go back to um, something that Kristen mentioned quite a while back, that 
we were talking to, or she was talking to some students who had gone through the Concord schools, who had gone to Willard School and so forth, had no idea that people of color had ever lived in Concord or who Jenny Dugan was. And so rather than saying, oh, we need to put in kind of for tokenism something about black history, we need to really hear the voices that have been silent for many years and read the writings that have not been available. And I think the uh, work of Robbins House, you know, all the work they've done with the letters of uh, Ellen Garrison and so forth is bringing to the forefront history that has not been taught and therefore has not been learned. And therefore, I think we have done a disservice to our students in the past by not doing that. And if we didn't do it now, it would be a greater disservice because we have so many more resources available, uh, both within the community and, and beyond the community. So I would say that rather than seeing this as somehow responding to or reacting to current situations around the country, we have been, as a, just to repeat, proactive for at least a half dozen years in this effort. And I I'd like, oh, sorry. I would agree that at the high school level in the English department, um, we've been working on this for a long time. And I think the kids know that, you know, we're in dialogue with the students and they know that we're looking for texts and they've helped us and we've had open conversations. And I would just want to say that to the elementary and middle school teachers, the students that arrive in my classroom are ready to talk about this. So you've given them a voice that I have not heard, you know, in like I've, 20 years I've been doing this, but it's, it's just a new sound and I love it. Uh, it's really fantastic. And, and um, you know, they, they know that we're all in this together and we're all working on it together. And so that's what's really fun about teaching, frankly. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the things um, at the middle school to have a little bit of a different perspective is in the, the kids that I've talked to, particularly the students from RISE, they don't see it as reactive, but I think they see it as not enough yet. And so after years and years of still feeling like um, we're making efforts, but they're not at a place where they're like, oh, yes, this is the most anti-racist school I've ever been in. So I think what we need to do, all of us, is just keep listening to the students and say, okay, we've started. Now what more can we do? And I'm glad to hear, Kate, that at the high school they're talking because it it's middle school is a funny age and they're really testing out those boundaries and really, you know, wondering, can I really trust these adults? Are they are they genuine or is it just for show? And so I think it, it's just a reminder. And at court, I really appreciate your question that we need to keep listening to the students and not just be complacent and sort of self-congratulatory, but say we are doing great and we need to do more. Um. I, I say that there are times when I get asked the questions in science, which, you know, I try to protect my African-American students when it comes to genetics and about skin color and about bio, you know, how diverse we all are. And basically, I don't shy away from the answer. I try to be as honest as I possibly can. Sometimes I've been accused of being a blunt by family members, not in a negative way, but I don't believe in, in skirting around the truth and also recognizing that we are all different and how wonderful it is that we aren't all the same because, you know, they just learned that if we were all the same and something came around, then without variation, everybody would die and there would be nobody to carry on. So they realize that variation is a good thing. And that's where I've been going with the kids and explaining things. Mm. And I must say, I wish I was teaching social studies because it, uh, or in a social studies class, because it seems like so like on fire. And as I remember growing through social studies and slavery, it was like the worst. It was like, I wish I could have dug a hole and dropped in and disappeared during those units and to have it taught in a way that um, doesn't shame students is wonderful. Thank you. And just to speak to the artistry of the educators in front of you, um, all of this is taught within the confines of the curriculum frameworks as outlined in the Massachusetts Department of Education. So uh, we're doing exactly what we are supposed to be doing in terms of teaching students skills and content. Um, 
but the artistry is folding in this very important uh, initiative for us. So that it's true, to art, true artistry. I just wanted to um, make a comment when Bob mentioned um, earlier, the ballerina that I met that worked with Tony Williams, she teaches ballet to high school students in Boston. She went to Concord Academy, I believe, and she had never heard of Concord's Black history. And when I joined Rivers and I, you know, we're bringing students to these sites, a lot of students know the history. And I, I'm hearing what Bob is saying, and I'm like, we we go to those road signs, you know, we go to those those tombstones, and uh, they've they've clearly heard it in their education prior to Rivers and multiple times, and so it's really inspiring to know that all this work is happening, and it doesn't feel like Rivers can do the curriculum that it's doing because of all the other work that's being done. It doesn't feel out of place or forced or prescriptive. It just feels like, hey, this is what's happening right now. This is what we're looking at. This is what we're talking about. And the students are, they're able to reach these really deep conversations out in the middle of the woods because they're coming to it with context where a lot of the older folks that I've met that have gone through Concord in some way, um, they are just hearing about all of this for the first time. Thank you. That's very, that's very, very helpful. At some future date, uh, Kristen, we'll ask you uh, to tell us more about how the the efforts of the pioneers that uh, are are sort of paving the way are being uh, replicated, shared, and replicated. Because I think that's key as well. Um, because I think uh, when peer turns to peer and supports them in these efforts, that's. Uh, complements any work that leadership could ever provide. Um, so I'll be curious how that works together. For sure. Yeah. I think hey. we're immensely grateful to all of you for being here tonight. Um, it's not a small investment on your part and we recognize that. And that's, I don't mean just today's presentation, but uh, stepping out the way you have and the way you've described how you've stepped out on behalf of your students. Um, so I just wanted Thanks to for having us. Sorry. Yeah. No, uh, of course, many thanks. Um, uh, I echo many of uh, the other school committee's uh, statements so far. I just wanted to uh, say something to Mr. Vassal about the Columbus Day thing. We, I think it's a big community conversation and not just school committee. So I, once we get your letters, I plan to share them with the select board so they get an, an idea as to the engagement of your students in this topic, um, because I think it should be. Oh, I, I've got it. I'll definitely tell the kids that. So this is also part of a speaking of the state framework. It's a graduation requirement for eighth graders to engage in a civic action project. So this was their first foray into doing that, writing you these letters. So I, it's exciting for it would be exciting for them to hear how far it goes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say to Ms. Bullwinkle, um, when you said blind spot, I, I think that's just so important for all of us. I know you guys know that, um, but it's just for me, I know I have so many <laughs> and I think it's important that we all, I know, I know you all take that every day thinking about, you know, what am I not seeing <laughs> and, you know, where are things in the curriculum that still mm, we should talk about? Um, yeah, I know you have to do some things in the curriculum, but I mean, I think this has been a, a year of revelations for, for everybody. Um, you know, it's been kind of building up. And I think this year was for many reasons, one like no other. So, um, and I'm sure the students feel that as well. So um, I thank you for per persevering, not just dropping this because of the COVID-19. Um, so thank you very much. One last thing, picking up on what Lucita just said, uh, just a thought of a possible civic action project. Uh, the youngest son of Jenny and Thomas Dugan, George Washington Dugan, who was a member of the 54th Black Regiment, uh, was listed as missing in action on the attack on Fort Wagner. And uh, he was the only man of color from Concord to serve in the Civil War. And his name is not on the monument in the center of Concord. Interesting. Can I call dibs on that? 
<laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Can I Can, come to like, class? Yeah. This sounds amazing. <laughs> I want to go to second grade. <laughs> Only because, you know, we're trying to find creative ways during the pandemic to meet this requirement. So thank you. Sure. Wow. I have a quick question, um, sort of piggybacks on Court's initial question, and then Sarah Bowwinkle sort of said something that piqued um, my interest. Kristen, as the person steering the ship, do you foresee a time in the near-ish future where there are so many adaptations to the curriculum where you can't even tell anymore as a student what like the dominant sort of, you know, that, that we've made these changes, I guess, is sort of what I'm speaking. Like Court was asking, are these kids aware? Does it seem reactionary? Do we have a goal, I guess, like to arrive at a point in time where this is just, everything is so interwoven and diverse. It's kind of becomes like a non-issue, like to Sarah's point where she said like, you know, it's not far enough yet. Do we have an, an idea of okay. when we will arrive there? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's an aspirational goal um, that every student feel they can see themselves and their family legacy uh, and history uh, and future in our curriculum. So, um, that's not to say that we would deny the reality of the fact that we have a dominant white waspy culture, um, you know, and, and part of the whole conversation, and I think you really heard this from the high school folks, is what does that look like um, and how can you have impact on that? So, yeah, I mean, I would say I want to make sure as a curriculum director that, that every kid can see themselves in a way that they can feel proud of in our curriculum. Yeah. If no one has a comment, I have a comment and a question. I wanted to really commend you on, um, on beautiful uh, curriculum. I'm so impressed uh, listening to um, how thoughtful and how professional um, our educators are. It, it, it's, it, there's such a big thoughtful process that went into it. Um, it I'm very, very impressed. And, and getting uh, rivers and revolutions, getting kids outside, you know, really reimagining that um, uh, the life under uh, in COVID and, and getting everybody outside uh, throughout the whole time and um, connecting uh, connecting kids to history and um, it, it's 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 amazing. Um, so um, I, I, I will be rewatching um, and and taking more notes on uh, the books that um, that the teachers are covering. My question is: um, uh, so as a school committee member, but also a parent, we only get a really a window into what happens in a school through our own kids. So I have a graduated um a graduate so i have seen the udl uh work that he he has done and i've seen uh you know the excitement and all the work that was covered um in his psychology class that you you were mentioning um uh, and you know those conversations that come home my question is um as you have mentioned some of um uh, students do uh, pick electives throughout the uh, high school do they get an opportunity to learn uh, the black history um american black history uh, uh if um if they don't pick um you know, if they pick more of a science elective, if they go a different route or uh, different route, uh, or how is that done uh, that they get that what you have um, been so carefully covering in a curriculum uh, gets covered, whether it's in English or history? Like, how does this how does this work uh, when it comes to electives and making sure that uh, kids do end up learning um, uh, learning enough in, in the high school? Yeah, I can give a quick answer and then um, Samantha, if you got, if you can sure. follow up. Um, so it's really clear what we have to teach 
um, in our ninth and 10th grade social studies classes, which are the two required courses. The problem is that both of them, the world history in ninth grade and the 10th grade US history are enormous survey courses. If you go to the you know, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education website and you look at the social studies curriculum, there's just no way. I mean, there are uh, probably, I want to say, 100 discrete topics of content. Um, so what I really love um, about what we do uh, is one, and I think CEDA really focused on this as well, uh, is to give kids some lenses to look at different content. So that's the skill. Uh, and not just, you know, taking a big survey course, but looking at each, um, you know, who's represented here, who's not represented, who has the power and so forth. Um, because that's that way they can uh, learn how to learn, learn how to be um, skeptical uh, consumers of current events, for example, or other history that they're going to run into over their course of their lives. Um, and then uh, the second part I would I would say is, even with our survey courses, um, which it's painful, um, we do try to choose depth over breadth, um, meaning we don't want it, you know, it to be March 13th and we're doing this huge topic and March 14th and doing this other different, totally unrelated huge topic. We really want to um, have kids remember uh, what we're doing in, uh, we always talk about 40 seconds, 40 days, or 40 years. You know, we want folks to remember, kids to remember in 40 years, the themes uh, and the skills that we looked at. So I would say those two things, um, but we certainly do uh, a black history within the context of the uh, 10th grade U.S. history course. Samantha, do you have other? Nope, you covered it. That was great. So I, I want to note that uh, uh, we have not given uh, Paula Martin uh, an opportunity to uh, dialogue with us tonight, but uh, we want you to know that's something we've been looking forward to very much, and we anticipate that in the future, uh, Dr. Well, Martin. Thank you very much. I, I hear we're going to hang out for a little bit sometime <laughs> in 2021. Um, I am just sitting and listening and being in awe and just really seeing what's happening. And you can't really put a pen in it. It has, the work continues mm -hmm. and continues. Um, if we think about it, the fabric that of our country um, has had some bad threads in it. <laughs> and we've never really seen the truth or it's been put um, in such a way where everyone feels involved. This kind of work, <coughs> excuse me, reweaves the fabric so that it's diverse, um, that it's explicit, um, that it's intentional. And um, I don't know if we ever end but the beauty is that the generation of students that's receiving this now they become our future and they will go forth with the language and knowledge to make a difference and that's how we you know change the world, that's how we change our country. It has to start somewhere, and this is a beautiful start. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for being here. This is such a thrill uh, to see and hear all of you and all the wonderful things happening. And Paula, I want to start by acknowledging you. I've never met you, but um, I have to say I like the, I like the necklace. <laughs> That's another I conversation, I, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> I am, I, I, I must say, I am of Moroccan descent, so this is, you know, you. what I can do. Yeah, I, I look forward to having you again um, okay. and having more time to um, get to talking and um, 
So yeah, I called my son, come say hello. When I saw your necklace, I called him and said, you have to come see that your teachers are here. <laughs> so his, his face just lit up. Oh, um, so yes, a lot of you I know, a lot of the reading, re- reading material um, I'm very familiar with. Um, I am just so thrilled and feel so fortunate to have my children um, be taught by so many of you. They have been taught by all of you because you're such such a teamwork, such um, collaboration. And I feel like you have all taught my children and taught me too. Um, So um, the, the, the reading that was presented uh, tonight and the reading that our children have 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 been exposed to, I think, is has such tremendous value, um, and it just opens these doors to them uh, to to an ocean of knowledge. That's it's an ocean without a shore. And once we get them there, I think we have achieved our goal. Um, I feel fortunate that my children are here in this school district, not because we have arrived at this utopia, but we are traveling together. It's it's a journey. Uh, we will get there. And I'm so happy that others before me said this phrase, uh, not enough yet. But I do want to say that we have plenty to congratulate ourselves on, plenty. Um, and recognizing that it's not enough yet, that is something to congratulate ourselves on and recognizing that. And um, I think that will keep our minds open, that will keep us working and looking uh, for that higher uh, ground and connecting our, our, our history, our town to the rest of the world that is not always acknowledged. I think that adds a lot of value and opens eyes and gives perspective. Um, I pulled the book here that um, I read recently about um, a poet from Persia who lived 600 years ago, and um, his name's Hafez, and I'm reading the book, and I find this quote. He has influenced many, many writers um, uh, around the world and over time, and I'll just show this. There was a quote from none other than Emerson, who says that Hafez was a poet of poets, and he was a man, the only man he wants to see and be. Whoa, that's my concrete collection. Uh, so, and we don't know this. I read an article on uh, the history of uh, transcendentalism in Concord uh, by a Concord historian, and it stopped at Thoreau and Emerson, and I wish they had gone farther back because that's what, not where it stops or not where it starts. Um, so th- there are these connections that make it easier to have these conversations. Um, where I think we can make uh, progress already, uh, things that we still say, like um, if we say ahead of time, I'm sorry for butchering your name, it's like uh, saying, you know, no offense, but you know, we know that not to say that anymore. So, um, and I hear it from children. Once you don't know how to pronounce their name, I think there's a connection that's been lost. And usually that's the first step that's first in, in the connection. So we can always make an effort, not uh, have it an accepted fact. I'm not going to bother saying your name correctly, or um, so that's that's one one um, one area. And, uh, holidays also get get tricky. We don't always know who celebrates what, and that's where the conversation come in handy. Ask you can ask the families, ask the students, or um, because not everybody celebrates around the same time of the year. Uh, so somebody eventually is going to get left out. Uh, but that's, again, we teach uh, everyone to to get to know others and celebrate with each other. Uh, but really acknowledge that we don't know everyone. We don't know uh, everybody's culture. Really, I think that makes, uh, that makes a difference. Mm. Uh, but I just, again, want to uh, re- emphasize how uh, proud I am of all the efforts, all the, the, the teamwork and the, the openness to um, 
newness to reinventing ourselves and not waiting until we have a crisis. We have evidence tonight that we don't react. We are we want to prevent crises. Uh, so I'm, I'm very proud and um, happy to see that is happening and congratulate every one of you. I haven't said anything because I'm speechless and I think they know how I feel. So <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. So it's been great to be here with all of you. I think at this moment we can say to the staff, uh, you know, two and a half hours, I think is, is a good showing and uh, we should all go home and, uh, you know, watch some culturally competent TV or <laughs> cultural <laughs> book. It sounds like we all have a reading list, but thank you for having us all. Thank, thank you, you so very, much for being here. Thank you for all of you. Everybody have a great night. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, wow, I was right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So um, I have a couple of proposals for our current agenda. Yes. Because the next item is so important, and I feel like we're all kind of overwhelmed by this presentation, I'm going to propose that we move this to the 18th. Is uh, everybody 15th. Okay with that? Yeah. 15th. 15th. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, would, that, I think that makes good sense. In the strategic planning conversation. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. My only other my only question to Lori and the chairs would be is there anything else, you know, stacking up on the eighteenth that's gonna um the school improvement plans. Okay. Yes, but I don't I can streamline those. They're they 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 all look somewhat similar because of the conditions we're operating under. And this is a big part of what you're going to hear in there, as well as the pandemic related pieces. So and they come to us in writing prior. Yeah, you're going to get them in writing and then we'll have a slider. So with each one, but it won't be it won't be two and a half hours. Okay. <laughs> I can promise that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I prefer not to move it, but I think uh, I really want to to give it the proper attention. Yeah, and I, I like agree. I want to be able to, yeah, I think we should all be able to focus on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm worn out in all the right ways right now. Yeah. I would make a, a motion to that effect, Cynthia, that the uh, item 7B, strategic planning, cultural competency, and anti-racism be uh, postponed until our December 15 <laughs> meeting. That for both committees. For both committees, thank you. And I'll second for both committees. And roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Out, I for both. Ms. Dad, I for both. Mustafi for region. Rainey, I for both. Wilson for region. And then I have a second proposal. Uh, would everybody be okay with moving winter athletics up to the next spot? I think that's the critical for tonight. Is it Dr. Hunter? Yes, definitely. So uh, I'll put that in the form of a motion that uh, item 9B, Winter Athletics, be uh, moved to our next item of business tonight. Second for both. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Out, I for both. Ms. Dad, I for both. Mustafi for region. Rainy, I for both. Wilson for region. All right. But I didn't want to follow that anyway, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, your variance reports don't quite. Die. Yeah. <laughs> They're exciting, Jared, but <laughs> The truth is, if they weren't, if they were exciting, they'd be in the wrong direction. Probably yeah, yeah. excitement. So we're glad when they're not exciting. We don't want exciting variants. <laughs> it should be boring. Uh, Mr. Jonkis, are you here and still with us to talk about athletics? I am here. Yep. Hi, Aaron. Aaron, you have slides to share, right? Hi. Hi. Thanks for being so. Patient, I do. Yeah. Sorry, you had to wait so long, Aaron. We're glad you're here. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. No, no, not at all. Not at all. That's um, it was very informative and really interesting. And um, as a parent in the district, I'm grateful for it. So it was it was outstanding. Good. 
Um, <clears throat> I am going to uh, just uh-oh he's sharing a screen okay karen Things were going too well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, Aaron, we there we go. There we go. They're, they're up, Aaron. Did I? Uh... We're we're looking at. Uh... Okay. Are this the slides are up. Yes, they are, sir. Yes. We're kind of... trying to just load it into the regular full screen. <laughs> On my oh, here we go. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, we got it. Beautiful. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I'm just here tonight to talk about the leagues uh, and our school's winter proposal for athletics. Um, we certainly recognize that uh, winter sports bring about a different range of concerns maybe than the fall um, with the addition of some indoor activities. Um, so I wanted to just uh, give everyone an overview of what those will look like. Um, just some context uh, with the timeline and what went on at the state level and what we've got planned uh, as a league. So the MIAA uh, went through a process where their sports medicine committee and sports specific committees such as basketball, hockey, skiing, swimming, um, all met to determine uh, safety guidelines. And they do that in collaboration with DESE and, uh, and the state um, before they release anything uh, to schools. So that was ongoing uh, right up until about uh, last week when they made their uh, decisions. So they postponed the start of the winter sports season until December 14th. One of the main reasons was to give a two-week break after the Thanksgiving holiday um, to, to uh, evaluate you know, the, the concerns around people traveling and uh, being out of state and family members gathering, of course. Um, as a league, we've also created a, a dead period for these two weeks where uh, we're not allowing any out of district, um, not out of district, excuse me, out of season coaching. Um, so we've just asked all our coaches and teams really to shut things down as a precaution uh, so that when we start on the 14th, everybody's healthy and um, we know that we, we sort of have a clean slate. As with the fall, the state voted uh, not to allow uh, any state tournaments or sectional tournaments. So we're going to play a very, very uh, modified schedule within uh, our league um, in the dual county league. So uh, this is the timeline here of how things sort of shaped up. And then uh, we're at the bottom bullet now where locally, um, you know, many of my colleagues and other schools in the league are making similar presentations uh, to their school committees and superintendents uh, regarding the plans for the season. Stop me along the way anytime if you if you have a question, um, please. Um, our pod uh, for competition will be the same as it was this fall. Uh, so we'll be with A, B and Lincoln Sudbury, Newton South and Westford Academy. Um, it's a little bit trickier in the winter uh, than it is in the fall um, because there are significant differences with basketball and hockey in terms of the level of competition. So um, there's just one wrinkle with hockey. We're also uh, playing Cambridge, Ringe, and Latin. Um, that's the only sport that will compete against Cambridge. Um, and then uh, for some of our ski teams, we compete in leagues that include schools outside of the dual county league. Uh, for example, uh, Winchester, um, Neshoba Regional. Um, so what we're arranging with um, the ski programs are to only hold dual meets, um, which means that we'll just compete against the schools in these pods um, during those times. The season uh, dates are December 14th through February 20th. 
Uh, nothing is scheduled to begin in terms of competition with other schools until after the first of the year. So really there'll be a six week period between uh, January 5th and February 17th uh, in which competitions will occur. The MIAA approved basketball, ice hockey, uh, swim and dive, alpine and nordic ski and of course we also offer fencing which is not an miaa sport um, but we do have many schools in the region uh, that participate we've currently got about uh, 350 students signed up for our winter offerings um, uh, they uh, moved indoor track and uh, wrestling to different seasons postponed them basically um, indoor track is one of our biggest programs. So typically we'd be at around 500 students for the winter. Um, but I think that the numbers are significant because it is a, a large percentage of our students that are benefiting from participation uh, in these programs. There were days in the fall where we had, um, you know, our 400 students that were participating in the fall program and then another uh, 100 or so that were participating in out-of-season practices that were run by our coaches. So on a day when you could um, see 500 of our students outside uh, with peers, getting some exercise, enjoying being together, um, it really, I think, boosted a lot of, a lot of students' morale over the course of those uh, months in the fall. These are the additional seasons that I'm sure we'll talk about uh, down the road. Uh, as I mentioned, indoor track was pushed to the fall two season, largely because there are no facilities that are available for us. I don't, uh, I'm not sure whether or not they'll be available uh, in February either, but, um, but we'll see. Um, and you'll notice uh, that wrestling, which is typically a winter sport, was moved to the spring. Um, and there is some exploration being done about whether or not we can offer wrestling as an outdoor sport in the spring. So we're leaving no stone unturned here. Uh, a couple of highlights. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but uh, some highlights for the, uh, for the winter. Uh, of course, um, you know, we'll follow all of the sports-specific modifications that have been designated by the Sports Medicine Committee and the state. Um, but some, some important details. We, as a league, are not allowing spectators uh, into any of our indoor facilities. Um, in the uh, gym and the hockey rink, um, we're really utilizing the entire space for students to socially distance. So if you can imagine the bleachers in the gym at the high school uh, during a basketball game, we typically would, would see you know, 12 to 14 students sitting on the bench shoulder to shoulder. Um, we'll use that entire area uh, basically where uh, we'll have teams on opposite sides of the floor and they'll utilize the entire bench area um, to spread out. So you may um, see a coach turn to substitute a player in and he'll be jogging down from, you know, five rows up in the stands um, to check into the game. Um, you know, every, everybody will be uh, wearing a mask that is required uh, at all times during competition, wow. practice, Anytime that students are indoors, um, you know, just like is mandated by the state, of course. Um, we'll continue to keep the locker rooms closed. Um, students figure out in the fall, um, you know, ways to be prepared. They arrive at practice dressed and, and ready to go without being able to use the locker rooms. We've got a couple of different alternatives that they've used. Um, I am setting up uh plans to stream events so that parents in particular uh, can watch. Um, in the fall, we had uh, Miniman Media Network was was great. They um, came to a lot of our games and were able to put them up on YouTube for us. They streamed a few of them live. Um, but in, in this case, we're, we're not allowing any spectators. I think we, um, we owe it to people to make sure that they can watch the games live if they'd like. Um, in the pool uh, for swimming and diving, all uh, meets are virtual. So, uh, for example, if we're competing against uh, Westford Academy, um, you know, we may choose a day to compete and um, we'll share times for different events and so forth. Um, it creates a little bit of difficulty with judging our, our divers, um, but 
uh, some teams participate in swimming in the fall and they've worked it out. So that's really been informative for us. Um, <clears throat> we're working closely with Conquer Recreation around the guidelines with the Beatty Center. Um, they've been running swimming programs all fall uh, safely and, and um you know, so they're really being helpful uh, working with us. We'll, we'll basically have pods of students that are um, arriving for practice. And in a two-hour practice, we'll have you know, two separate groups that will come in and get about 50 to 55 minutes in the pool. So a lot of different adjustments, but I think that um, you know, ultimately the goal is to give students an opportunity to participate in some fashion um, because we realize the, the benefits overall. Questions I can answer for anyone. I didn't really want to get down to the too nitty gritty, but um, did want to give an overview of the program and sensitive to the time, especially after the length of, uh, of the last one. I, I just want to say I read the basketball modifications and they're extremely extensive. Um, and it will be challenging to all as, as I'm, Aaron, as I'm sure you're well aware. Um, to, to do this work. It's going to take a lot of instruction to coaches and, and student athletes um, to accomplish this, but I think everybody is um, invested in, in making the attempt and trying to make the best of it. So, um, I think there was a there was a degree of uncertainty at the beginning of the fall as well. Um, you know, in, in particular, um, you know, soccer had a lot of modifications that uh, seemed um, very difficult to implement. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a lot of confidence in our in our coaches. Um, they're really prepared at all times. Um, you know, they've had those documents now for over a week, and they've been, you know, researching them and trying to figure out. You know, and we're working together to try to come up with plans for each sport. There are pretty significant differences for all of them, of course. Um, and the indoor ones were, you know, are really the focal point. Right. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that I, uh, Mike Mastrullo, Aaron, and I met with Susan Rask and Trish McGeehan and I posed the question whether this was a good idea at all um, with the rising case counts. And, you know, I think we're at a place of we're as comfortable as we can be with what's a little higher risk than the fall was. You're inside hockey and basketball are more more contact than the outdoor fall sports mm -hmm. were. Um, we did really well this fall, so that's giving me some hope. But we're also putting in some precautionary tales for kids and coaches as we go into this. I talked with uh, Acton Boxborough superintendent, just heard some of their strategies and shared them. And I think we're in agreement. You know, if we get one positive case on one of these teams, we're going to quarantine the team. There's just too much potential contact with each other, not to consider them close contacts. So I think that's a fair statement to everyone involved that that will be the plan. Um, and if it keeps happening, that's going to be another discussion too. So, you know, this really is, let's give it a try. I think the good news, you've heard me preach quite a bit about the exposures we were getting from the outside groups playing. It does seem to have reset some. Um, the return back to the hockey rinks have not brought what we were getting prior to. I think the precautions, I think the messaging and the precautions both got tighter. Um, so that's that's also giving me a little more uh, optimism that this can be successful. So I think the answer is we feel that we can be as in control and um, productive at this as anybody. And the kids are with us rather than out with other teams, which we also are sure would happen if we didn't play. So, you know, we're here recommending it with a cautionary tale of we're, we're going to try it. We're not quite sure how it'll go. Um, we're hopeful, certainly, because we think it's an important opportunity for the kids in such strange times to have some sense of something normal and unifying and, um, you know, social. And Aaron, when does the season start? Uh, December 14th. But that's just, it, so actual play starts? Oh, no, I'm sorry, January 5th, after the new year. Right, so that's, I think, um, you that's know, they're not going outside of their bubble until after the 
um, mm -hmm. holidays. So we're just going to have to keep an eye on where we go. Yeah, and we're really talking about, um, you know, the basketball and hockey teams will play, you know, eight to ten games total. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do a lot of intramural uh, play um, to keep kids involved. Um, so, you know, we'll, as Lori said, you know, we're going to, we're prepared and hopeful for the best. Um, if we need to adjust, if uh, along the way, I think all the schools in the league are going into this sort of eyes wide open that um, it could be very different from the fall. Yep. And two questions, Aaron. First of all, thank you again for all the detail and time you've put into this. Um, oops. Are you, it looks like, you're, Aaron, it looks like you're talking, but we can't hear you. No, I'm just listening. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. It was, I guess it was the video. Um, sorry, so two questions. One is um, for the sports that practice off site, off campus, so I guess hockey, Nordic skiing, alpine skiing, how are we dealing with transportation back and forth? Is that all families? Are you looking at busing? So there's, uh, there's really three different answers to that. Um, hockey has traditionally uh, gotten themselves to the rink right. uh, because they often will practice at odd hours. Um, we're fortunate to not have those six o'clock in the morning practices anymore, but they do happen later in the afternoon. So kids can go home after school uh, before going over to the rink. Yeah. Um, Alpine skiing, we traditionally take uh, two buses. Um, and uh, Nordic is traditionally two buses also. So Alpine practices at Neshoba uh, Valley and uh, Nordic over at the Western Ski Track. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a couple of different things. Um, Neshoba right now is only planning on opening during the latter half of the week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we traditionally have, have trained Monday through Thursday because a lot of our alpine skiers will go uh, after school on Friday up to some of the bigger mountains, and it's just kind of a tradition with that program. So we're looking at a combination of um, dry land workouts uh, on campus, so taking advantage of the turf fields um, and, and campus, and then utilizing the half days on Wednesdays um, to break the team into smaller groups so that we can get everybody uh, to the mountain, to the hill, I guess, uh, at Neshoba. Um, and that'll be a combination of um, parents driving, uh, you know, kids potentially being able to drive themselves. Um, and then, you know, what we did in the fall with transportation was to make sure that our numbers were really reduced. Um, so we had a few, up, you know, a few trips in the fall that we took um, for teams and there were always less than 20 students on the bus. Um, so because the number of competitions overall is dramatically decreased, our transportation budget is not what it's typically, uh, what we're typically going to spend in a normal year. So we can add a cushion in where in the past, if we've needed two buses, you know, I can order three if need be or four or what have you. Um, so we're still in the planning process there for, for the Alpine team. Um, one of the things we're looking at for the Nordic team, uh, if the weather cooperates with us, is um, uh, creating a, a trail basically for Nordic practices on our lower grass fields on campus so that students wouldn't have to leave campus um, and, uh, and they could do some training right at school, uh, which would be great, obviously, for a number of different reasons. Um, the other thing that, that uh, the ski track in Weston is doing is looking at the possibility uh, of expanding their hours a bit. So uh, instead of maybe training Monday through Thursday, uh, it's possible that maybe we're training Wednesday and Thursday and utilizing a Saturday or utilizing a Sunday as an optional practice where um, families can help with tr uh, transportation. So you know, given the numbers that utilize these facilities, we're all looking at ways to to uh, decrease the number of students that are there at any one time um, and also evaluate how we handle transportation safely. Wow, that's great. Oh, and my other question um, was a follow-up to something you said um, 
you mentioned in downhill skiing that there are dual, there'll be dual meets, but it's some towns that aren't in our pod. And I think I, I didn't quite understand what you meant by that. So will they still be competing against those towns that are not in that pod or no? No, that's not the plan right now. So, okay. you know, on a, on a race day in, a, in an Alpine event, eight schools will go to the mountain on any given day. Right. And they'll all compete against each other. Right. And so what we're, what we'll, we're all working on as a league is, is creating opportunities for us to compete against the schools in our pot. <clears throat> so, just so, you know, West Ford Academy has exactly, exactly. Got it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Great. Thank you. So I don't know, uh, Aaron, I don't know if you're going to call me practical or pessimistic, uh, but if a team were to go into quarantine for a couple of weeks, do the coaches uh, have in the back of their minds that uh, they'd move to virtual just for the engagement piece that's so critical to kids? Yeah, I think so. I think the spring uh, demonstrated that um, you know, we're able to do that to continue the sense of community and, and, and team, uh, camaraderie and so forth. Um, so we've got, um, a bunch of coaches who are multiple season coaches, um, folks that have that experience already. And, um, I think all of us have become familiar with, uh, connecting online over the past nine months. I apologize for going there. Okay. Thank you. No, no, that's, that's like you said, it's practical. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, uh, Dr. Hunter, do, uh, do you need a vote from us on this or this is tacit approval and appreciation to Aaron and his team? Yeah. A, a blessing is all we need. I think tonight. <laughs> Well, thanks, Aaron. I th we really appreciate you coming, and uh, yeah, and I know that you, all the coaches are probably doing as much as they can to make it a safe and um, positive experience for for everyone. So, thank you to all of them, and thank you to you. And I hope you can come check in with us in January and tell us how well things are going. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. I hope so too. Well, thanks very much, everybody. I appreciate right. it. Thank, Thank you, Aaron. Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Have a good night. All right. So. You too. Bye-bye. Just one comment for the Concord Committee. The middle school is putting together a proposal for intramural basketball that I'll bring on the 15th of December. Okay. Thank you. And so now we've come to the variance report. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so let me open it up. My computer is dying, so I only have one screen right now. Um, so CPS, uh, we're in good shape. Um, we, you do see a negative there in fixed assets. Um, it's 90,684.72. Do you guys need me to share my screen or? We've got a link also if that there is works a link. for everybody. Yeah. Um, so uh, we we do have a negative right now in the ninety thousand uh, in the seven hundred uh, seven thousand series fixed assets. The reason for that is, is because we just purchased the e the the electric bus uh, grant. We had to encumber the full amount, and then once we decide what the leasing options will be, that will offset. So it's just that an encumbrance is not an actual uh, expenditure. Great. So it's a faux expenditure that gets replaced with a lease. Correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then the programs with other districts, uh, that is going down as the, um, I said in previous variance reports, it's just because we have uh, circuit breaker money and in, in, um, IDEA money coming in and we are charging it uh, to those accounts. So that will, that expenditure will actually decrease. And on the C, uh, the high school side, uh, 
again, we're, uh, we're in balance. We're in good shape. We were able to encumber all of the debt and retirement service. So that's why you see the, uh, if you remember the last report, it was about 10 million, uh, a little bit higher as an available balance. Um, now that we were able to encumber that, um, our, our available balance did go down. Uh, programs with other districts, same thing as the CPS. Once the money comes in, um, we will able to we'll be able to offset that in the circuit breaker, uh, as well as the IDEA. So we're 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 in, we're in really good shape right now, uh, and this will fluctuate a little bit more once we um, figure out all the Cares Act money that needs to be uh, spent by December thirtieth. So uh, I'm working with Ian Rames. Um, right now on that and um so that's uh so our, our available balance will actually go up a little bit at, on both budgets because of that but we're in uh we're in good shape when would you expect to be able to report to us on the cares act Expect by december 30th so probably the first meeting in january uh we'll be able to we have to have everything all set by the 30th um, so I, I plan to know exactly what uh, is going to be expended by the, the holiday break. And could you also let us know how it was expended? Sure. Yeah, uh, we, ha we have to have a detailed report. We are going to be audited on this. So we have every cent. We'll know exactly what salaries, what PPE, et cetera. Uh, and I can break it out into categories, et cetera, for you all. And it's separate for each district, obviously. It is, yeah. yeah. And just one more question regarding the CARES Act. Did any money flow to us from the town's CARES Act money? Yes. So right now, um, the CPS budget is being offset by an additional $400,000 from uh, Concord. I do have a discussion next Monday with the town of Carlisle to see if they had any monies uh, that they could... Um, we could use for for the high school. Okay. I'm not exactly sure yet. Okay. Um, but so yeah. And then yeah. Okay. So we we'll hear about that next time <laughs> or January. Yeah. Okay. Chair, does the CARES money need to be spent or allocated by the end of December? It needs to be spent. Um, so we can't just load up right now on PPE and other things. Technically, you, you're supposed to have everything uh, already in or in, um, and sort of expended and used by December 30th. Granted, there'll still be some sanitizer and, and face masks, uh, et cetera. Um, not much, but you really supposed it's really supposed to be used by December 30th. You know, we're really doing more of a reallocation for the CARES Act more than we are spending out. Um, and Jared and I've talked a few times about really digging. You know, there's a lot of staffing pieces there that aren't as obvious. The super, student supervisors are the really obvious ones. But then you look and, you know, we, we maintained more tutors than we had planned to. So we had those that resource. If you look at kindergarten class size, I was ready to um, consolidate some classrooms and we left them instead. So a portion of the, even those kindergarten teachers could be considered COVID related because that's exactly why we left them. Yep. So we're making our way through it, but it really will be about a bookkeeping project more than a spending project. Correct. Yep. So. Because there's only so many, so much in PPE you could really buy. Um, right. But and they warned us all, don't, don't we'll fill warehouses of stuff like that. They want it used by December. So, right. But we, and it, it is valuable to know how we're doing that. So, if mm -hmm. federal money does come to us next year, you would have a good idea how to absolutely. allocate that. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And to your point, Cynthia, whatever salaries we're looking at, we're only looking at half a year's worth. Yep. And the second part is still budget or is anchored in the budgets right now. So it would be nice if there is more money coming, we might do better in terms of full years worth of salaries where we had to, you know, bring in, bring in full-time employees. 
But and, the, and the good thing is, is everything that even though we, we're still working on reclassifying to the CARES Act, everything is encumbered. There are some things that are already moved over. So, but there are things that uh, everything is encumbered for the most part, um, which is it, it's going to greatly help the uh, general fund balance. So if there's no money come January 1st, I think we'll still be at this point okay. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. Wow, thank you for managing all of this so clearly. Team effort. A lot of this is really Ian Rames, so I can't, I can't take a lot of the credit on that, so. Well, thank you to Ian. Thank you to both of you. <laughs> is there anything else on the variance report? So uh, we're on to early retirement incentive FY22. Right. So the goal tonight was just to put it out for uh, first discussion, or at least to get you thinking on it, hoping to return to it in a couple of weeks. Um, we, as you know, we had some people take advantage of the offer when we put it out in August, and um, that did allow us. Some of what you just looked at is, especially in the Concord budget is a uh, benefit of some retirees uh, going with the with the plan and going earlier than perhaps they had thought. I think the reason I wanted to bring it out now, um, it's actually even more helpful to us if we have the conversation ahead of the budget process and then people notify us during the budget process and we embed those savings right in. That isn't really, we did some of that last time, but we could really maximize the benefit of that. Um, it continues to be a program that has felt like a win-win. The employees who participate are grateful for the opportunity. Um, we are benefiting in terms of savings, obviously. Um, so we continue to find that spot where only people who think it's a good fit to where they are take advantage of it. Um, so we don't have mass exoduses. I don't predict we would have that this time. I haven't, We. I didn't talk with the unions about surveying. My, my anticipation is we'd have some level of participation at CPS. I don't know about the high school. Um, so the services. I think it seems, seems wise to okay. at least put it on the radar, have a discussion. We could put it out to staff for options if you were to approve it in a couple of weeks and um, you know see the level of interest and have those savings right off the beginning of the build of the budget. So we included some numbers here in the memo so you can see where we've been at with the savings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think just really putting it out informationally tonight for consideration in two weeks, unless you tell me tonight you're totally not interested and we should just not go forward. Um, I would say it's been successful in the past and that we should at least consider it. I'm not saying definitely yet, but... Um, yeah. We should certainly be looking at it. It's been very successful for us in the past. And as always, the one uh, qualifier that I will add, and when we discuss it next time too, will be that we don't want to set a precedent of doing it every year. But because of this situation, I don't think this sets a precedent of every year. And therefore, I'd be comfortable with it, um, you know, if everything else makes sense. So in the past, we have had a cap on it, have we not? A cap in terms of number of participants? Yeah. No, we no. haven't needed it. Um, okay. We've not, in the past, we've done a lot more survey work to see what the interest would be to be sure we're not going to land in a place that got difficult to manage. We just surveyed people in the in the summer, so I feel like I have a sense without okay. resurveying them. Um, I, I would hope that uh, the committee would uh, have time to debate uh, should we move forward, uh, debate a $30,000 number and a $40,000 number. I'd like to sure. look at uh, how we might line up with uh, other area Metro West districts more than we have given the finance or financial uncertainties. Absolutely, yeah. But I'm, I, to your question, uh, Lori, I'm, I'm inclined toward it. Um, I think it makes fiscal sense. Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay. So just in terms of 
next steps, you said you'll bring it back to us next time. Is there, is it basically this information that we should review and be comfortable with? Um, it sounds like, Court, you're suggesting that we discuss level or amount of offer. Um, I just want to make sure if we're going to discuss this next time that we're prepared, what do we need for that discussion? Right. And any other information you need us to bring would be maybe the... Well, I think for the last two rounds, we've been at a $40,000 number. Have we not? We have, yes. Okay. We could run some, some, you know, we could run numbers to, you know, say there's five participants and look at what the differentials are. So you have some <clears throat> comparison. Is it to get any other benchmarks of, like... Are other schools running similar programs in our general vicinity? Yeah, we haven't done that. We haven't done that round of check-ins uh, recently, so we could do that for sure. I mean, it doesn't need to be extensive. Tomorrow, to a dip or two. Yeah, yeah. I'm in a I'm in a roundtable, uh, a job alike group tomorrow, and I can and I can ask around too. I think the numbers will be helpful too. That'd be great. Um, yeah, I think the numbers will be helpful too. The, the numbers, uh, if we have um, uh, numbers in terms of what this is going to save us, uh, and also if we have a number of people who are interested in participating, um, that would be uh, helpful. I don't think, I, I think the probably the superintendent has a rough idea, um, but it's, you know, it, it, it can fluctuate either way. Could, yeah. <laughs> And I think we have to be okay with that. You're not planning on surveying between now and the next. I wasn't, but we could. You have a... Yeah, based on what I know of last summer, my thought is it's three to five at Concord and maybe maybe none at the high school. Um, okay. So, but that would be summer-based data. And that, that's also a number, though, that even if, the, you know, a, a couple got added in each place, it's still sure. very manageable. That's not... Yep. They're not high numbers we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So is that, are, are we asking, it, it sounds like we're asking Jared to, to ask some questions and bring us a little information on what other people are doing. Is that enough for everybody? Yeah. Okay, good. Great. Yeah. Thanks for bringing this. Thank you. And then the cost savings, Fatima, are, are pretty well defined in the memo that we have. They are, yeah. Yeah, yeah we have really nice, longitudinal history now to see cost savings and that we definitely benefit for years okay. um, even with the payouts still happening yeah and we get two large numbers of people at the high school so that you don't end, you don't see another nine for this year right? no i actually i'm not sure you know we had no interest this past summer when we offered it i'm not sure that that's changed um so no Okay. Um, okay. Right. I think we've reached the end of our agenda. I think so. Okay. So, uh, Lori, our, our uh, thanks to the faculty was not uh, uh, in any way exaggerated for their benefit. It was... It was a, a really extraordinary session. So helpful. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I, you know, I, I know of all of that, but to see it K-12 in one place in one setting, really amazing stuff going on. Yeah. It's inspirational. It really, like someone said, it makes you want to be in the classrooms. <laughs> well, of course. That's what we're here. Exactly. <laughs> So. And it's reaching, you know, we're reaching all kids in some cases because we're changing texts that all kids at every at that grade level are reading. You know, we really are starting to see the systemic pieces start to take hold, which is so that the to hear somebody say to, it was Kate Fleming to hear Kate Fleming say that students as they're coming into high school are having more context and more depth to have these conversations now. I mean, that's that's concrete change right there yeah. just from, you know, a few years of work already it's just, that that was really impressive. Yeah. Yes. I will pass, pass all that along again. Thank yeah. you. Great. Okay. All right. Are you looking for a motion? 
Yes. <laughs> I will move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committee is adjourned so that I can go eat something. <laughs> I second the motion for both. You want that in the note, the minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because sure. I think we're all in agreement with that at this point. <laughs> uh, roll call. Anderson for both. Uh, booth eye for both. That eye for both. Is that eye for both? Rainy oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Mustafi for region. Wilson for region. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Have a good night. Bye.